Steve Purcell, welcome to Tech Talk with Daniel. It's great to see you in real time. <laughs> you know, I always talk about the fact that LucasArts Adventure Games taught me English. And out of all of them, Sam and Max Hit the Road is the game that enriched my vocabulary the most. I, I honestly think that my life changed the moment I looked up the meaning of the word misanthrope in the dictionary. Yeah. So thanks for that. <laughs> I think there's a lot of Mike Stemley in the uh, sort of language. Mike, I always say that uh, Stemley would always make the characters a little smarter than I would. Mine are a little, my versions of Sam and Max are a little more feral and a little more callous and his are a little more educated and have a better vocabulary and are better read. As characters. Let's start at the beginning. How did you get into art? Well, I like a lot of artists. It was like the first thing I did was draw. And um, even when I was like three or four, you know, I was drawing, I was copying things I saw on TV. My One of my relatives saved a little sketch, which I still have, that says Stephen age four. And it, on one side, it's Yogi Bear. On the other side, it's Bozo. And so somehow I had done recognizable versions of those characters. And so, you know, what I was looking at on TV, even though I was terrified of Bozo, I was, you know, compelled to, to draw him. Do you know Bozo? Bozo the Clown? Mm -hmm. He was like a local, yeah, local personality in different areas. Everybody had their own Bozo, but he was like this terrifying clown with this big hair. He'd like come up to the screen and his face would look all sweaty and stuff. But one of the first things I ever drew was Bozo. And uh, so I just drew continuously all through school and was inspired a lot by what I was watching on TV, Warner Brothers cartoons, and Hanna-Barbera cartoons, and probably a lot of stuff that wasn't very good as well, but just inspiring for whatever reason. And uh, all through school, people just expected that I would be somebody that found a way to make a living by drawing. And, you know, I think people would have been disappointed if they found out I didn't end up doing something that was art related for a living. So all through school, um, that's what I was interested in. In high school, I got more interested. Actually, it was more middle school. I got interested in uh, making movies. And I had my dad's eight millimeter camera and I would do little stop motion movies in the backyard with my GI Joes. And I did a few where I actually drew the cells and, you know, kind of very limited animation. But, but that was something that interested me pretty early on is making little s stories on the film. And so that kind of followed me. It was kind of like a parallel course that took me all through high school. I made some movies with my friends. There was one called I Was a Teenage Twinkie where my friend Xander eats a, or he's actually bitten by a vampire Twinkie with the, has fangs and he turns into a Twinkie. And so the Twinkie was like a six foot bolster cushion that we had, I had animated it kind of, you know, in stop motion traveling through our town and like leaping into cars and attacking people and stuff like that. So that was something that took a lot of my time and High school, I was really interested in filmmaking part of it. And the other side of it was doing artwork. In high school, they would always find like pamphlets and stuff for me to do artwork for and the school mascot, things like that. So that sort of made up for what a kind of mediocre student I was. I was able to do this other stuff that sort of fulfilled the need and made me feel useful and sort of like a mini celebrity because people would see that stuff and, and uh, recognize it. So that was always fun. So you were doing practical effects and animation at the time? Yeah, I was, I mean, be, because I was doing, uh, yeah, there was, I had fun actually carving that Twinkie. I bought a bolster cushion at the upholstery store and I carved it into the shape of a Twinkie and made the cream holes on the bottom and I spray painted the whole thing. Yeah, I don't know where it ended up, but that was the prop that we used in the, in the movie. And, uh, and since I had done stop mo for, for my little GI Joe projects, um, I would take my toys or my models and things and move the horizon in stop motion. So we used to use stop motion to move the Twinkie around on the screen sometimes. And what was your first paid job as an artist? Um, probably my first paid job. I, I was pretty young. I was in school. Actually, my first, my very first paid job was probably in 
fifth grade and my teacher, Mrs. Green, I think, paid me like probably less than a dollar to draw Snoopy on a greeting card. She wanted to give a greeting card to somebody and she wanted a drawing of Snoopy and I was able to kind of manifest enough of a recognizable Snoopy for her and she paid me. So that might have been my first job. And then later on, there was times when I remember doing a label for like a bath soap. Somebody had marketed their own bath soap. I must have been like 12 years old or something like that. And I did this little line drawing for their label. Some kind of little intricate, you know, seal or something like that with hand lettering on it. Couldn't have been very good. And I'm amazed that they painted me, paid me for it. And there was one that I remember and I kind of, it was kind of a train wreck where a guy that he had a, some aspect of construction, um, he wasn't a general contractor, but he was some specific contractor. And he asked me to paint his logo from his business card on the side of his truck. So, you know, and I was, I think I was, I had to be in like eighth or ninth grade. And so I was using model paints and I was hand lettering this stuff. And I was trying to make it make sense. I wasn't a sign painter and I wasn't a trained, you know, painter of anything that goes on a car. I wasn't a, you know somebody that does like pinstriping or anything. I was just a kid. And so I was trying to paint this guy's logo on a car and, and I painted it on both sides and kind of muscled my way through it. And I think he paid me like $10 a door for, for each one of those. And wow. I don't know that he was excited about them. I think he came up and went, huh? Ah. Yeah. So I, I have no idea if he lived with them after that or if he uh, went off and had it scraped off and had a real, professional do it. But it, it was actually pretty remarkable that he hired somebody my age to do that because I don't know if they would do the same. But over time, I would do little kind of jobs like that, line illustrations for, you know, like a business or something. I remember painting a sign for a soccer supply store. So, I painted this, I think it was like an eight foot long sign with this train character, almost like a Thomas the Tank Engine kind of guy that had like a soccer ball for his nose and did an oversized painting of that for, uh, for the store. And that was fun. I, I do like painting in big format. I like doing kind of mural size things or oversized drawings. And I do like working in different mediums. So, you know, that was part of it is getting a chance to do something that was very different from drawing a picture on paper. And all through school, I also kind of dabbled in, sculpting things, making things out of Play-Doh, making Planet of the Apes masks for my G.I. Joes and all these little silly, you know, projects I was giving myself. I was uh, dabbled in doing magic tricks when I was a kid. And so at one point I decided to carve this wooden hand, which was part of a magic trick where you have like an electromagnet under the table and the hand wraps on the table. And so I spent the time to carve this a uh, human hand that looked like it's from the 1800s or something. Also, yeah, you're just kind of sparking all these things I used to how to do to spend my time. One, one of them, I, I'd make my own wooden ventriloquist dummies in high school. So I'd find a way to kind of, you know, carve their heads and figure out what their, you know, mechanisms were like and stuff. So I always had an interest in doing a lot of different kinds of art, not just one kind. Sometimes I admire people that kind of pick a path and stick with it. But I always felt like I had to try different kinds of things. But probably the most prominent were the kind of parallel courses of illustration and making movies. First of all, that dollar and those $10, when adjusted for inflation, they're probably worth, I don't know, $100 nowadays. So you $11. Got, so you got paid. <laughs> Yeah, I walked away with the money, but I wasn't sure that they. You should have framed that first dollar. Did a slam dog on the job. Yeah. yeah. I probably spent it on the way home. Well, first of all, it's great that you had a, a busy childhood with things that you actually like doing and pursuing as a career afterwards. And so it seems that, again, you were trying to work in everything that's related to art in general. When did you decide on a path of drawing characters and drawing comic strips and such? When did you decide to choose that as a path? 
I actually did choose it at one point and and I think it was when I because I had been doing movies in high school, I'd still been doing the art, but then I went to junior college and took some film classes. And at that point, I just didn't draw for a couple of years. I just was like making little silly movies and stuff. And and uh, at some point, I realized, well, I have this ability to draw, um, which comes pretty easily to me. And so maybe I should, you know, commit myself to and my education to kind of honing some of that skill instead of just chasing the filmmaking and leaving the artwork behind. So um, in our area in Northern California, we had a school called California College of Arts and Crafts at the time. Now it's called the California College of the Arts. And uh, I had been at junior college for a while. I had a bunch of units saved up and I figured out if I could, uh, if I could go to that school, which I would end up paying for myself, I could probably get a degree in a couple of years based on all the credits that I had. And so I decided to go there and I studied uh, a little bit of illustration and I studied a little bit of um, fine arts. I think my major was fine, jello fine arts, which again, it's like, oh, it's not just this. It's not just this. It's a little bit of everything, which, you know, it's some painting and it's some etching and it's, you know, some illustration in line art and it's some illustration in painterly art and so it was a, a mix of a lot of things and at that point i kind of realized that that's where i was gonna head i kind of snuck into filmmaking through the back door ultimately but i decided i was going to be an illustrator and uh and kind of focused on that at school but also like another parallel path that kind of opened up. It's like, oh, there's a school paper. I'm taking the paper class. Oh, they need a comic strip every week. So I started doing a comic strip on the back of our school paper. And the first few were just random general things that I would think up like, oh, I had a job as a donut delivery driver. So I'll do a strip about that. And one of them was how to make a kite because I had uh, spent time on Nantucket Island and learned about kites. and, and and then one day I did a Sam and Max strip, which was the first kind of published Sam and Max strip I had done. I had done ones for fun on my own at home, but that was the first one that was done for publication. And I did a few more after that. It's like, oh, this is kind of fun. These voices are kind of speaking to me. So um, maybe I'll do some more of these. So what was the origin of Sam and Max? The origin, which I've told in interviews before, is, again, when I was a kid, there were a lot of different kinds of things that I liked doing art-wise. And me and my little brother, David, we both liked doing our own comic books. So I would do like silly superheroes, and I think one was called Super Stooge, and um, he had his own little characters, and he had these detective characters called uh, Sam and Max detectives and they were drawn in his style and one was a dog and one was a rabbit and he sometimes wouldn't finish the comic he would leave it kind of sitting aside in the house and I'd go I was kind of a mean big brother and I'd go find his comic kind of undone or maybe forgotten and I'd go and I'd kind of finish the drawings in sort of a parody of a style of the way a little kid would draw and so I'd kind of make fun of like the shortcomings of a little kid's drawings where, oh, its hand is on backwards or um, he's drawn different in this panel. And because I was writing the word balloons in the comic as well, I'd have the characters comment, oh, Sam, your head is drawn wrong in this panel or, hey, your thumb is on the wrong side. And it sort of became part of the style of the way the characters would communicate with each other. And at some point, my brother just lost interest in those characters. And I just started doing my own versions of them, you know, where I would just start, you know, I wouldn't wait for him to do something. I would just start my own. And, and they start, started emerging, the style started emerging out of doing, doing those over and over. Okay, Max has a little round head and he's kind of tubby and has little spindly legs. And 
Sam is more like a Humphrey Bogart kind of guy. And still, they would be kind of randomly rendered in each frame and, you know, totally mocking, you know, the, the sensibilities of the story they were in, sort of breaking the fourth wall all the time. And it was, it probably wasn't until I did the strip for school where I sort of thought I had to kind of at least steer it towards a style that would, if I did it again, you'd recognize the same style instead of just playing with the the conceit that they are just badly drawn or whatever. It's just, I'll, I'll pick a style for now and this will be what it is. And it's a style that I have to be able to do the night before I have to turn it into the newspaper class the next day. And Dave gave you the rights to Sim and Max on your birthday, right? He so- was a little, yeah, we were both little kids and he, I have the document somewhere he drew. He actually wrote it. I hereby give you the rights to these characters. I won't draw them anymore and you will. I think I draw the, drew the characters on the document. Well, you'll soon celebrate the anniversary of that contract. Yeah, I'm not even sure what year it was. It's probably on the, on the document. but And I'm sure it's you know, totally legally binding written by a little kid. Yeah, I'm, I'm certain of that. <laughs> Now, you started designing cover art for video games as far back as 1983, beginning with Tryon in three dimensions for the Atari. Oh, wow. How did you land that gig? Yeah. I'm not as pleased that that's the one you remember. That's not one of my favorite ones. Um, but there was uh, that kind of led, came out of uh, where I lived in the East Bay in the San Francisco Bay area. There were some little companies that would hire me to do spot drawings and illustrations. And there was one company that sort of precedes the try on game. They were, I think they were like a a store that would repair Apple computers and stuff. Mm -hmm. And they had their own little line of games and they, they hired me to just do simple. I think the covers were printed probably like a color Xerox and then slipped into a plastic sleeve with the discs or whatever. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and they would just totally give me free reign, like, oh, it's a space garbage truck. And so I just paid it in my cartoony kind of comic-y styles. And, oh, it's a, I think there was one that was like a, like a Yeti kind of character in a cave. And so... I did a few of those, and I always liked doing the funny ones the most. And I think the Tryon, I think that was a different company, and they had come to me with this um, game that they had created. And for that one, I, for whatever reason, I decided to do an oil painting. And I remember it was very challenging to get sort of the effects they were looking for in my painting. So I don't consider that one one of my more successful ones, but I remember the the ones I did for the Apple Store were really fun and um, ended up, because of that, doing some like uh, role-playing game cover covers. Um, some were magazines and they'd say, oh, it's a zombie screaming to death. Oh, thank God. That sounds like a lot of fun to paint. So if I could do a couple of those a month, I could pay my rent and, you know, survive. And um, it was uh, as a freelancer, when one of those would come through, I'd be really excited because it's like, oh, I get to paint a fun thing and I get to survive. And uh, I never knew what the content of any of the games were. I would just ask them, what kind of monster do you want? What else do you want in the frame? And I'd figure out the composition from that. And they were very agreeable. They usually just, you know, accepted everything. Well, usually, glance, so. usually in the eighties, the cover art would look very different from the actual games because the games were eight bit. There's nothing in the games. Yeah. 16 colors. If the it character was, would be like, a, like, he would look like a triangle or he'd look like some kind of a, you know, little collection of pixels that didn't reckon resemble anything. So your cover art was the gateway to the mind of the game developer <laughs> to see how he envisioned either the characters or the game, because for us, a cover art was the only thing yeah. that was binding between how we <laughs> imagined these pixels look in real yeah. life and how they actually it were. It gives you a little baseline. Yeah. So you can kind of project yourself into the, what you expect the 
game should be. I, I, I play, we, I think our game machine that we had in our house was in television. And so, you know, again, very, you know, primitive graphics for the actual game. And some of those games were really fun. I remember one where you're kind of creeping around in hallways and spiders are, I think it was called Night Stalker or something like that. And uh, again, there was barely anything to the artwork, but, but they were fun to take up your time. And I still remember soundtrack. I can't remember my loved one's birthdays, but I can remember the soundtrack for Night Stalker. Wham, bam, 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 bam. And you know, nowadays when you see trailers for computer games, there's always a disclaimer at the bottom that tells you if it's the in-game footage or the cutscenes so that you'll know what to expect. But back then it was agreed upon that the cover art has nothing to do with the game and we're fine with it. Yeah, it's just a, a, a pact made with the audience. Here it is, here's what you wish it was. And so... Buy this game and get a whole different game. Yeah. But nowadays what they're showing in the, you know, in the screenshots you know, going to be exactly like what the illustration will be anyway. So there's nothing they can't do in the on-screen graphics now, right? Exactly. So when did you start working at LucasArts? Well, that, there was a little bit of a path leading to that. After school, I had done some, I was in the Bay Area and I was doing freelance illustration. Like I said, some of those games and, you know, the, uh, the, Dungeons and Dragons stuff was keeping me busy. And at some point, uh, there was a call from Colossal Pictures, which was a local um, animation house. They had uh, sort of done stuff for, uh, they did a lot of commercials, but they had done stuff for MTV, liquid television and stuff like that. And in the Bay Area, there weren't the number of animators there were in Los Angeles. And so they put out a call to illustrators. So we're looking for anybody that can draw and we're going to teach you to animate. And then we can call you when we get a job. We don't have to go outside of the area. And so I took this class and it was great. It was like taking a, you know, a junior college class where you just go in and they give you something to draw. I think I, my first assignment was a drawing Teddy Ruxpin popping out of a Jack in the box or some, some weird thing like that. And it was fun. It was fun to kind of see how they did it and use their, you know, they had the nice animation tables and stuff and see how it was done. But that at some point they figured out that I could draw illustrations. And so they started hiring me to do character designs and things that actually ended up paying more than, than doing animation. So I came in and I would do character designs for things like, um, they had like a seven up campaign in Europe and I do like 50, seven up guys, like a guy with hair made of bubbles and things like that. And there was a show called Ed, Ed Grimley based on the Martin Short character. And I ended up doing a lot of the secondary characters. They just give me a script and here's 10 characters that I would spend the day figuring out what the, all the ancillary characters looked like. So it was fun and it was kind of uh, a lot of ongoing work there. And I worked there for, it seemed like a couple of years. And at some point, um, I think the last thing I worked on there, they were getting ready to do a uh, Back to the Future show. And I think I did a couple of sample backgrounds for what that might look like. And I did a few more Enoch flies and docks, you know, sample, just sample pieces for consideration. But right around that time, I got a couple of calls. And one call was, um, I think it was, it was Skellington Productions. They were working on Nightmare Before Christmas. Nobody knew what it was yet, but they were looking for storyboard artists. And I got another call and it was from, I guess it was from Gary himself at Sky, Skywalker Ranch, Lucasfilm Games at that time. And so it's like, oh, which one of these things should I follow up on? And I ended, I don't even think I went to the interview at Skellington. I think I wanted to go to Skywalker Ranch and see what was going on up there. And, um, and had an interview with Gary and just was, you know, soaking up the atmosphere and had zero interest in making pixel art. But again, it's like, oh, maybe I should know how to do this. Maybe it's worth spending my time learning how to work on a computer, even though I have no experience in, 
um, not that much interest in it and don't play games that much. Um, I just want to be in this world. And so I chose to uh, work up there instead and didn't follow up on the, on the storyboard job. But I, at that point, I had done some comics also while I was working for Colossal. I did some, a few Marvel comics that I wasn't, you know, I wasn't really a mainstream comics artist. It wasn't until I did a Sam and Max comic that I sort of figured out, oh, this is the kind of comic I should be doing. I shouldn't be trying to draw superheroes. That doesn't make any sense for me. Well, Sam and Max are superheroes. <laughs> Yes, and how do all superheroes wear capes? That's right. Exactly. But yeah, it was, that was sort of my voice. So that was the real voice of me doing comics was that first book that I did. And I, I guess I had done that while I was doing freelance work. It seems like I carved out the time to work on it though. So I'm not sure if I was doing other stuff at the same moment. I remember spending, I remember telling myself, I'm going to spend four months doing this book. Because who knows if I'll ever do another one on my own. And uh, and I just put everything into it. And that was sort of when I'd said before, hey, when I did those strips for the school paper, I had to figure out what they looked like. So this was a, it's going to be a whole book. I have to figure out how I'm going to draw these characters on every page so they don't look different on every page. I'm going to spend the time and and I'm going to put all the what the mad, mad magazine artists used to call chicken fat in all the frames, which is just little silly things, little gags that aren't connected to anything. It's just fun, you know, texture for your eye to look at while you're reading the comic. So I just took the four months and put it into that book. And basically doing that book, and I only did a handful of Sam and Max comic, but that that book basically opened every door after after that professionally. Everybody had seen that, that that I ended up hiring me over the years or, you know, people that had seen that book or knew about it or somebody lent it to them or something like that. And also in the case of Lucasfilm Games, I believe it was Ken Macklin that had seen my comic and, and he put my name in the hat for somebody for them to possibly bring up to do artwork. And what was your first day at LucasArts like? My first day... Um, driving up to this beautiful place. I lived in the East Bay, so it was like a 70 mile round trip, but it's nestled in the, I'm sure other, in the other interviews, people have talked about what the environment was like. It's nestled in the rolling hills of West Marin. And so there's long windy drive up through, you know, forest to get there and you know, and it's basically designed to look like a Victorian estate with a, you know, a winery and a, and a mansion and stuff like that. So it was amazing to go out there. And I think my first assignment, they probably gave, there's probably a lot of, you know, showing me around and things like that because Gary loves showing off the place. And uh, I think my first assignment was doing uh, these avatars for something they were working on and i i want to say habitat but that i'm not sure if that's correct or not but there was like here create these different characters that you will play in this environment was it so much a game as some kind of environment that you would go and and inhabit some character there so but for me that was fun enough because i love drawing monsters and creating characters and so that was a fun thing to do and i don't know that i worked on it for more than a day or so or a couple days um and they kind of pulled the project it wasn't they weren't going to follow through on it at that point and so it's like okay i guess steve doesn't have a job after all and they shortly figured out that uh i could paint and they needed a cover for zach mccracken and um and so i was pitched the game i don't think i played the game but i was pitched the idea of the game and shown all the elements and again it was like one of those things we were talking about earlier where okay the game has its limitations in the way it looks on screen and so we'll just blow it out and here's what we wish everything looked like for playing it and so 
I did that cover with the main character standing in the pile of the, I think the alien bodies and, and the girl is near him. And a lot of people told me I painted myself into that, into that cover, which may have it's, been. It's one of my time. bonus questions. <laughs> did you paint yourself? I didn't intend to, but well, as one of my teachers used to say, it's like when you paint, you tend to paint the face you see in the mirror every day. And so I think at the time, you know, who knows? I, I probably did it inadvertently. I wasn't trying to do it. I think I was just trying to struggle along and do a nice painting for these guys because I felt like I was getting a nice opportunity to do something that was cool for this company. At what stage of development was Zach McCracken when you began creating the cover art? Because I'm curious because the cover art includes they quite must... a few inventory items and I assume you wanted to ensure... They, they had to be pretty far along. It's not completely finished because um, it seemed like shortly after that we rolled right on to, um, on to Indiana, Indiana Jones. So we must have been, they must have been pretty far along and sort of, if they're doing the marketing stuff and the packaging, it seemed like they must have been. Okay. So I'm curious because the cover art includes quite a few inventory items. And I assume you wanted to ensure okay. that they'll be included in the final game before designing the cover that includes all of these items. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the covers would come pretty late in the process. Um, so if there's anything on that cover, it's because David Fox asked me to include it in the, in the cover. I didn't just go willy nilly and pick out a bunch of things, but I think so they were this, very clear about specifying what should be on the cover. This is one of the things that I like about your covers that you can continuously look at them and always find something new. I remember looking at this cover <laughs> art for years when I had the, oh, the big box and still. Every now and then, I'd look at the cover and find something new, like the the box of crayons that says Purcell on it. Right. It took me a few years to notice oh, yeah. that. Yeah, I would often try to find ways to get my name into the cover without just signing it and see if I could incorporate it into something that was in the shot. So, um, so that's a non-toxic yeah, I, I do crayon enjoy that. box. <laughs> it does come out of... Uh, I used to tell people when I was inking comics when i inked the first sam and max comic and part of that idea of adding a lot of stuff i find that process so tedious and i would use a crow quill pen which is a dip pen and you kind of drag the line and so you kind of have to wait for the line to dry before you can get your hand too close to it and um, so i would to keep my interest while i'm having to do this tedious task i would add things and so things that hadn't been in the original drawing i would start putting them in and so that was part of the fun of uh adding those details oh good i get to draw a rat over here you know carrying a hot dog or something like that and that was the way i would motivate myself to move forward oh boy and this next frame over here i get to you know figure out what goes goes in that corner so I think some of that comes out in my illustrations sometimes too. If there's, if there's an opportunity, I'll look for some place to put something that's fun to discover on second viewing. And in Zach McCracken, you were also the illustrator of the mock newspaper, the National Inquisitor, which was yeah, that dated, was really fun. Which was dated March twenty ninth, nineteen ninety seven. Interesting. And I, I recall eagerly waiting for nine years after the game's released just to read it on See. that specific day. <laughs> and did you? Yep. <laughs> well, what was fun about doing that, and I think, I don't know if they always knew they were going to do that. There's something fun about doing that where I was able to just, I was just accessing my comic style for that. So everything in there is just basically the way my Sam and Max comic looked, the way I inked and the, you know, the way I would design things was basically what I had done in that comic. And so it was really fun because I, again, I had free reign to kind of figure out what all these things were. And if there was some way I could add something to the joke and the way it was staged in my little drawing, it was always fun to do that. And we used to, there, there used to be more of these, there used to be more of these you know, tabloids around at that time. Like you'd go to the, I think they're more slick now and they try to make them make more sense now. But at the time they really, you know, the tabloids that were on the 
shelves in front of the checkout counter were very bizarre and just they would just swing for the fence and the stuff they would think up. And yeah, nowadays they so try to make inspired. themselves look like serious newspapers, but back then yeah, they took pride it's... in being a tabloid newspaper. Yeah, now it's more celebrity, you know, tragedies and stuff like that. Where at the time it was more about aliens, you know, Bat Boy and all that kind of stuff. And so you drew all of these illustrations in the newspaper, all of them? I believe so. Yeah, it's like it. Um, and there was a standee that I did. I don't know if you've seen that. I did a standee of the alien that had a actual uh, nose glasses attached to it. And I think in the ba base of the standee, there's like some little, I can't remember, it was like a Lucasfilm fan club or so there were some kind of little forms in there that you send in. But it was fun because I, it was fun to do something that was die cut. So one of my drawings, you know, it was cut out of cardboard and it would stand on the, on the counter at the game store. So even though you're working in the games industry, you weren't bound by the limitations of computer screens or graphics mm -hmm. by that time, because you actually illustrated either actual props like the newspaper or the actual cover art. Mm -hmm. That was nice because, you know, I was doing a lot of game art. And so whatever the limitations of that, you know, getting to do the illustrations was sort of the you know, the contrast to that where, okay, now I get to just have fun and make it look the way we all wish this stuff looked on screen. Now, the year after Zach McCracken, you were asked to paint a portrait of the Edison family for the 1989 reissue Mania yeah, Convention. portrait that's right behind me. What are your recollections from that project, given that you have the portrait right there? Yeah. Um... I'm trying to figure out where that fell in the timeline because I had been doing artwork for the other stuff for a while and I had been doing the game artwork. It felt like that one came sort of after, maybe after the, you tell me the timeline, like would that have been after Monkey Island had come out? No, that's before. Because it, the, the, the thing is, is that release dates from up to the late 90s weren't that exact. Yeah. You could barely get the sense yeah. of the year, uh, let alone the, the month in which it came out. So Yeah, I'm trying to figure out how it feathers in because I had done Zach McCracken at least and I had done those so, illustrations, so 19, but I was also okay. doing game art. And so, so in, 19, in, 19, in, 1989, one, in 1989, okay. there were four games that we're going to discuss. First of all is Maniac okay. Mansion. Then we have Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, the action game. Then the graphic adventure. Then Pipe Dream. So all of these are dated okay. 1989. Right. I'm not and certain in which month each of them came out. So Pipe Dream came first? Yeah. Maybe so. Okay. I mean, what's unusual about this one is when they gave me the assignment, they were going to build a little model of the hallway and they wanted me to do like a little painting, maybe like a eight by 10 or less painting to hang in the little model hallway. And then at some point somebody said, you know, it's going to cost us as much or more to make a little model hallway than a full-size hallway. So why don't you just do a full-size painting? And I love the Haunted Mansion at Disneyland. And I thought, oh, okay, this is a great opportunity to do a oil painting. And I think it had to be done really fast. And I think part of my deal was I get to keep the painting. I knew they were going to put it in a gold frame and they were going to, it, at one point, it had a little plaque on it that said the Edison family. And so my recollection is that I did that painting really fast. I did it with like thick bristle brush brushes and did it about a weekend, I think. And was really happy with the way it turned out. It was, it was very kind of sketchy and sort of spontaneous, the way it was kind of contrived. So I was pretty pleased with the way it turned out. But again, like I can't quite remember how it fit into all the game art I was doing at the time and other covers things like that. I think it was just normal for them to come to me to ask me to do the marketing stuff, which was great. I loved having that outlet to do my own stuff while I was doing their stuff. 
still in 1989, how did you find yourself being a playtester for Their Finest Hour, The Battle of Britain? <laughs> and what feedback do you remember providing back then? Um, wow, playtester. Which was the first of those simulators? Do you remember the name? Was it was there one was was there one called Battle Fox? So Battle Hawks came out a year before the Battle of Britain. Well, what I was going to say and the way I remember it, and I don't remember doing any official play testing for Battle of Britain, but when we were, a few of us were sharing an office in the back of the stable house, which was sort of the outermost building complex at Skywalker Ranch. It was like a little shingled building with like a courtyard. And there was one big office on the corner that, it backed up on a little creek, so it was a beautiful place to work. But I think there were like three or four of us sharing that office space. I want to say Mark Cameron, I think Kalani Stryker was in there. Um, I was in there. I'm not sure if there was another artist at that point. I'm not sure if Mike Ebert was there yet. But at some point, you know, Larry was doing these simulator games. We all had a copy of Battlebox on our computer. And so, at the end of the day, when you get kind of wind down, you sort of be worn out and you just need a little break, we'd all start firing up our own, you know, we couldn't play on a network or anything, but we'd play on our own desk. And so, you'd hear it, you'd hear the first one because the little engine sound that came out of the speaker, you'd hear that start in one corner and then at some point, everybody's machine was like, we were all flying our little missions and just because we you know we just enjoyed playing these little short missions and you know that was just a way to wind down at the end of the day and it may have been that coming out of that they let us play battle of britain and give you know notes and things like that but i don't know that i sat in a room kind of devoted to battle of britain it's probably just that we were you know thinking about it because we were probably playing it at the end of the day on our on our computers. Yeah. And, and at the time, like the first thing we thought when we were playing with it, it's like, Oh, I wonder if they, they'll ever make an X wing game out of this because this would be really fun. And at the time there wasn't really any star Wars stuff. I think the star Wars game license was tied up in the, the arcade machine. Uh, that's the mm -hmm. only star Wars thing. And, and I think Lucas film games was prohibited to, from doing any, Star Wars stuff for a while, but it was funny to think that there was ever a time when Star Wars wasn't, you know, forefront in the Lucasfilm world because there was a while where just like a black line where there wasn't a lot of Star Wars stuff. So it's like, ah, you know, it feels like a natural make a, you know, X-Wing game out of this and eventually they got around to it. Well, us adventure back, game fans are very pleased with the fact that LucasArts was prohibited from making a Star yeah. Wars games because we actually got adventure games and not five simulators yeah, per year. I think that's a good take on it because if they had the license to do Star Wars at the time, maybe you wouldn't have ever gotten a lot of the games that came out of them. Exactly, because in 1993, around 1993, when LucasArts got back their license to create look, uh, Star Wars games, then they actually started creating more and more Star Wars games until they actually became a company that licenses Star Wars games to other companies or yeah. creates them themselves. Yeah. So basically, you were a play tester just because you used your breaks to play the game? Probably so. Um, you know, if we were playing with it at the end of the day and something occurred to us, we probably wrote it down and passed it on to the to the development crew and but I don't remember an official process. It's probably more like a just a nice kind of tip of the hat for us for paying attention to what was going on in the game. Very well. I had no idea I had that credit. <laughs> so still in 1989, you're credited on the Amiga version of Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, the action game, which I consider to be far superior to its DOS counterpart. What was your contribution to that project? I do not have a clue. Maybe you could help me kind of recapture the moment when that was created. Well, I, I wonder if there's... So that's what's my still, credit? Your credit is for art. 
Yeah. So maybe it's some kind of cleanup or adapting something that wasn't so quite. Let me show you the you know, artwork. Maybe you'll remember. I mean, there are always times when there'd be like a, a slower time and hey, who's available to do, you know, clean up this title screen. So this or is something. the Amiga version. Yeah. So. So it's to, like a side scroller kind of thing. Yeah, it's a side scroller. And, <laughs> you know, there are sprites of indie walking and running yeah. and climbing up ladder. It's and probably making those look good. It's probably maybe there was some, you know, routine they did to adapt those from one format to another. And then somebody had to go in and make them look good or something like that. Or maybe there's a couple of frames because that needed to be Because the DOS version... If we take a look at the DOS version, it looks like this. Okay. And, and so, as I said, your version is far superior. <laughs> so. Well, there are a lot of those kind of jobs where who's sitting around in the room to fix this old thing that we're going to put more detail into, or we have some more colors now, you know, who's available to spend a few days on this. So that would happen very often. Okay. Moving on to Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, the graphic adventure, mm -hmm. where you're credited yeah. for illustrations, graphics and artwork, and whip research. That's right. What kind of whip research did you perform in that project? Well, it turned out that um, up at the ranch, we would wander around the ranch after lunch. We'd you know, go for walks so and we go look at the paintings because there's beautiful, you know, Norman Rockwell paintings hanging up in the main house. And we just had free reign to roam around and look at everything. And they had one little case in the front entryway and it was some props from some of the movies. And uh, one of the props was one of the whips. Um, I'm sure, you know, I, over years I've heard, you know, there's different whips for different shots and there's little short whips for close-up shots and long ones for when you'd have to swing and things like that. But they had one sitting there. It was just such a beautiful thing. And I just became obsessed with this whip when we'd walk by it and looking at it. And I remember going to the research librarians and I said, where do they make those whips for the movie? And at the time, there was this, uh, was, I guess it was a company already, but the librarian didn't give me a catalog. She just gave me the guy's phone number on a piece of paper. And I basically called up the number and it was this old guy up in near Seattle and uh, asked about the whips. And he said he made them out of kangaroo hide and he would hand, hand weave them. And um, I ordered one at the time. The conceit was, oh, I'm working on this game. It would be good to know how to crack a whip and uh even though you know who you know we're drawing these little guys so you'd never know really from looking at the artwork if there was a real whip ever as part of research i just wanted a whip and so i ordered one of these whips and this guy i don't make too many of those anymore because it hurts my hands and so i feel like i got one of the last ones that the guy that made them for the movies actually made um and I brought it with me. It's one of my favorite physical objects. You have the actual whip? This is my whip that I had ordered oh. at the time, however many years ago. When I first got it, I was really disappointed because it was this kind of pale flesh color and like uncooked, you know, pork or something like that. And it's taken years for it to take on this kind of patina. I'm sure when they do them in the movies they like put a some kind of glaze on them or something to get them the right color right away but when this whip arrived it was kind of stiff it wasn't soft and <laughs> supple and like i said we had an office that was on this little creek and there was a little field behind it and i would go out there with the whip and try to figure out how to get a crack out of it and i spent basically spent that summer out there you know just you know, swinging that whip over my head and trying not to get cracked by it. And and the whip slowly loosened up over time and it took on a little color over time and get kind of damp from the damp grass. I just remember the, the way that 
valley smelled at that time of year with a little bit of moisture on the grass. It's just such a beautiful environment. And I'm out there trying to figure out how to do the Indiana Jones whip. And we would take turns with it. When I think Martin Cameron whipped his glasses off at one point. At some point, I kind of, I figured out how to do it. And uh, so I could point it at like a weed or something and clip the top off the weed. And it, it turned into this funny thing where like if a magazine came and wanted to take pictures of the development crew, I'd get to, you know, crack the whip in front of the photographer or something like that to show it off. So it was just something I, I, I think because of working on that game, I became more attached to the franchise than I had been. I, you know, I liked the first movies, the first two, but, you know, getting to be involved with the, with the creation of the game on the third movie, getting to see the movie early and just kind of being, soaking up all the the artwork the creation of both games the action game and the adventure game (laughs) yeah thanks for reminding me i worked on that other game um but so that whip that whip needed 30 years of dust and then moisture to get to the form yeah they they got a patina i didn't put anything on it 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 just turned this color over time and i you know i put oil on it but i don't put like a stain or shoe polish or anything on it so and it's nice and soft and you can there's a part on the end this leather part that kind of and did they actually the smaller, smaller did thing. they actually record your whip cracking yeah. sounds or the you know movie? what? I think Gary told that story, and I love that story, and I hate to dispel the truth of that story, but that did not happen. That they they did not use this whip. You know what they might have used this whip for? There was um, some publicity they were doing for the movie, and somebody came down. One of the um, sound designers came down. And they found out I had the whip, and they came down to use it. So whether they used it, it wasn't me cracking it it was cracked for some kind of recording so i can see your face you feel the same way i do when i heard gary tell that story or whoever it was that told it, i went "Ooh, that's a great story someday somebody's going to ask me about that i can either go with it and just enjoy the the you know notoriety of that story or i can kind of tell the truth i can't so, believe people are lying in my conversations <laughs> Sometimes the story is better than the, the actual truth. But this whip got used a lot, and, you know, or, you know, when we do publicity and stuff, it would always come out. I believe it oh. was, it might have been an on-camera interview that they used it for. It's like, hey, how did we get the sound for that? Because it was, I think it was around how they did the sound effects for, for the movies. It was recently that I was working on something for Pixar, so we were up at the ranch doing um sound design for it and uh at the time they were working on the most recent indiana jones and uh one day i couldn't be there when they were going to go down to the foley stage i sent a message of hey tell them if they need any whip cracking i'm available yeah you could have done whip cracking sounds for the latest movie <laughs> and then that story would the, have been true then i could have wouldn't have had to lie. that story <laughs> <laughs> And in 1989, you also worked on Pipe Dream. Pipe Dream yeah. was and still is a favorite of mine. I remember playing it nonstop back in the day. What was your contribution to the project? I, I'm trying to say I created that little guy. Um, and so I'm trying to remember if I did on screen stuff of him. I, I think I at, at least drew him on screen. Yeah, there's the splash okay, screen. I'm not sure if he was animated on screen or. Yeah, I can't. Uh, that's a painting, basically. So I, I think there was a digital version of him that I probably drew. Whether I did any of those pipes, I can't remember. And I remember thinking when this, when we were doing this game, it felt like an oddball for us. Like, oh, we don't really do games like this. It's cute. I remember it was fun to play with it, but I don't. It didn't seem like something that we normally did, and I wasn't sure how it came about that we did it. But um, I remember getting the job to do the, the cover, and I think they needed it really fast. And I, um, I, I, I see I a pattern here. Everything quickly. they ask you to do, they need it pretty fast. Sure, absolutely. 
that's like that everywhere. Right? Now, as you can see here, the, the game was originally known as Pipe Mania, and it had a slightly different cover. What was the reasoning behind the, the cover change apart from the name I thought change our itself? Version was, I thought the first version was always Pipe Dream, and I thought Pipe Mania was, a, was some derivation of it that was perhaps some other marketplace. Because so I always that, heard it called Pipe Dream. I, I never heard of Pipe Mania until I saw that artwork, which I saw years later. So that's the interesting thing, because it seems like Pipe Mania was the original one. And then Pipe Dream was the, the ports that were done by Lucasfilm. Yeah. But Pipe Mania well, still has maybe, that guy oh, that see. you drew. So you're saying that this that Pipe Dream was an adaptation of some existing thing. Is that what you're saying? Kind of. And I think that Pipe oh, Mania... Maybe, maybe it was. I had no idea. And, and so in Pipe Mania, it seems like they used the guy that you drew, but only yeah. part of the drawing... And they added that weird screaming guy in the background, which I guess... Yeah, because it makes it one. more exciting. I've got to play this now because there's a screaming guy. Maybe I'll be the screaming guy if I'm playing this. It'll be so exciting. Um, yeah, that's a weird choice. I wouldn't have designed that cover. <laughs> the little guy's name was Chuck, by the way, which I believe was an in-joke because I think it was Steve Arnold used to like give the name Chuck to everything a lot of things you know but the plants yeah, to well, strange antagonists a strange version of the cover and pipe dream as far as i know was the first project in which you worked on the cover art in addition to working on the in-game artwork did you find that really? frustrating to work on cover art where you had no limitations and your drawings could turn out exactly as you envisioned them Compared to working on the in-game graphics that were restricted in color, pixelated, and generally limited back then. So you're saying Pipe Dream came out before Monkey Island? Is that right? Yeah, Pipe Dream came out in 1989. Monkey Island came out in 1990. Okay. If you remember, you worked yeah. on Monkey Island before, <laughs> back in 1989, but you had to stop working on Monkey Island because you had to release... Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade yeah. coincide with the movie I don't think release. we worked on it. Yeah, I don't think we worked on on my. It's probably called Pirate something at the time. I don't think we worked on it. on before. Monkey Island. Every, yeah, everybody said, "Holy crap, we're all gonna jump onto this Indiana Jones thing because it needs to come out right now." So, mm -hmm. so I don't think that there was a lot of uh, time that we spent on Monkey Island at that point. I don't remember Pipe Dream coming first, but. I, I might have been working on the artwork for Monkey Island while Pipe Dream was in progress. I I feel like Pipe Dream was probably something that was really short short turnaround. Yeah. Um. Based based on what the artwork was and stuff, it feels like a little you kind of off off ramp rather than a big whole project. I think we kind of cobbled cobbled our contribution to it together pretty quickly. So that's why it kind of, in my mind, it's like, oh, I must have done that after the first Monkey Island cover, at least. Yeah, I guess when you work on several <laughs> projects simultaneously, you, these things kind of mix. And you yeah. don't remember which one came out first, because the moment, yeah. the time in which you've worked on the project doesn't always coincide with the actual shipping date. So you could have worked on something right. before a whole different thing, but they ship years yeah. apart. And, that, and a lot of this stuff just fades away over time, like, you know, decades ago. Like, I'm amazed at some of your interviews where people can remember exactly what was happening from moment to moment. And I'm like, Ugh, what? Well, you also remember a lot of details about the things you've worked on. So, yeah. Well, I need you to kind of motivate it. Otherwise, I wouldn't remember. It's like, oh, yeah. That's why I'm here. That reminds me of this. Well, thank God. So you're credited for your involvement in the Secret of Monkey Island demo. Now, I'm aware that there are multiple versions of this demo. One version places the okay. trail at the end of Low Street, while another allows some exploration of High Street within certain limitations. Could you specify which of these versions you worked on and elaborate? I have no exactly? idea what you're even talking about. The Monkey, the <laughs> monkey Island... The demo? Secret of Monkey Island demo, yeah. 
okay, here's what I guess it is. You know, they're trying to figure out how, you know, what the characters are going to look like, what the backgrounds are, how they're the going to function. Passport for adventure. So it sounds like, it just sounds like a couple of, maybe, is it a couple of rooms that you get to explore kind of thing? Is that what yeah. you're, what the demo looked like? Yeah. And they're, mm-hmm. they're probably feeling out what, how are we going to do this? What's it going to look like? How are, what's it going to, you know, how are the characters going to speak and stuff like that? So I'm sure I, they probably asked me to generate some, artwork for that whether it's backgrounds or just animation i'm not sure because i haven't seen that in a long time or if it's anything they ended up using for the actual game i don't know um so but it makes sense that i worked on that but i couldn't tell you what it was it sounds like sort of research and development kind of stuff here's how tall pirate is here's what our main character might look like here's how his walk cycle might go Here's what he might say in that room. That's that's what I imagine it is. Password. You remember Passport to Adventure? No. No, what is that? So Passport to Adventure was probably released with magazines and or sent uh, via mail by LucasArts. And it was... Like a little disc? Yeah, three demos of of, uh, three LucasArts games. You know what? Now I have to Where show you. This is Passport to Adventure. So it had the Lucasfilm logo, and then you had okay. three games. You had Indy, Monkey Island, and Loom. And then yep. you'd go play Monkey Island. Right. And so it was a very limited version. Because as okay. you can see, the, the pier is blocked over here with a troll. So that's not in the sure. final game. So there are certain locations that were uh, blocked. Yeah. So, I think I drew a batch of those guys. And you can talk to them and they tell you how, how awesome the final game is and how yeah. uh, limited the demo itself is. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there well, are people who work... Sense. <laughs> there are people who worked on the the game itself but are not credited on the demo so if you're credited on the demo itself it seems like you had something extra created just for that demo that's my hey, theory I wonder what that is <laughs> we'll never know maybe I'll yeah. interview Steve Purcell one day but that yeah I mean that demo i mean that goes pretty far down the road from indiana jones like indiana jones was where i was sort of figuring out how to animate anybody and how to you know how to even work in this medium because it's not a medium that i would have thought i'd ever do anything in so i was looking recently at some of the um in the title sequence we had the train going by it's kind of a little homage to the sort of boy indie part of the movie but we couldn't do that whole part of the game. So we just did the trains and put the credits on the trains. I was looking at those little train cars and going, oh, that's kind of a neat pixel drawing. It's like I was mm-hmm. really pleased with how those turned out with the, with the colors that I had to work with and stuff. That was and, awesome. Um, I remember working on that. But, um, but Indy was where it was sort of like figuring out, like, how do you animate a person and this, you know, because it was a step off of uh, Maniac Mansion. It looked different because the characters were sized more like real people. So they're smaller and which meant there was less information in their faces. So you had to kind of do a lot of body language acting. And I wasn't really a trained animator. I was just figuring it out on the fly. And, uh, and so it's sort of, you know, just feeling out the medium and I think Indy had the first special case animation, which is, you know, the thing that doesn't happen anywhere else in the game. And it was Indy slipping and slipping down into a gully or something like that. And so I spent the time to animate him all the way down and kind of, and it was a little slapstick. I remember there was a conversation about, oh, is this too slapstick for Indy? In my mind, when I think of Indiana Jones, there that's what's charming about the franchise is that he's not so cool that he can't be in over his head. And so that's mm-hmm. what I sort of liked about the idea of it, it being comedic. Um, like if you look at the first movie when he's running away from the 
you know, before the rock comes down, he's like hanging on a vine. It's like he thinks he's going to get some purchase and then the vine keeps pulling out. So the charm of it is seeing him being over his head. So that's what I was trying to get into that little moment of special case animation. And I think that it was, I think it was the first time we ever did that in one of the games. And then, and then later there was some stuff where, you know, he kind of, if you pick the wrong rail, he, turns into a skull and I, I would get uh, handed those kind of assignments pretty often where something horrible had to happen. I would awesome. get to draw that. And when even the anticipation, I probably made it too comedic. If you pick the wrong rail and Indy drinks it, it's like first the pressure builds up in his jacket and then I think his, he turns into a skull and his head kind of flips through the air and lands on the, in the water. So... But nobody stopped it, so it's in the show. Okay. Loom is very close to my heart, and it's the first adventure game I finished. Now, you're credited on the game for character design and animation, visual effects animation, as well as graphics and artwork. Can you elaborate a bit on your contributions to this game? Graphics. I'm wondering what the graphics and artwork is. I, I know that I worked on some of the characters... I probably did some of the close-ups of the characters. I don't remember like designing the look of the characters, but maybe maybe that's something I did with Brian. Like he had some idea in his head what he wanted them to be, and I drew them and kind of adjusted based on what he was looking for. So that makes sense that I would have done that. I'm not sure what was the last credit you listed. Graphics and artwork, and you have visual effects yeah, animation. Visual effects, that makes me think, oh, somebody exploded or there's an effect that comes out of a like magic effect or something like that. That makes sense that I would have done that. I can't remember doing it. I remember more the character stuff. And there was one animation I did where somebody's head flies through the air again. Mm -hmm. um, I was getting typecast as a head flying through the air animator. Uh, oh, in his uh, but... GDC talk, Brian Moriarty <laughs> talked in length about that animation and how amazing it looked and the fact that it was 3d in a time where 3d was considered just a character walking behind something that was 3d i remember that all the lucasarts adventure games in the back cover would say a 3d adventure game and why would it be 3d all right because you could walk behind objects but this was right. actual 3d you could uh, see mandible's head flying off i know why yeah, I know why you said because the head moves in in space, where normally mm -hmm. our stuff is so proscenium based that you know making the head go towards the camera is a big big deal at the time. I remember it was just fun to do, and um, I can't remember if there were limitations on how big that head could get when it was flying towards us, but I I, I do kind of remember Brian being pleased with it, so. That's nice to hear that it's memorable to him. It's memorable to him to this day. That it's the only <laughs> animation that he mentions in, the, in that talk. Well, that's cool. Now, in my conversation with Mark Ferrari, who, among others, created the cover art for Loom, we talked about the fact that he specializes in creating backgrounds, which is why the Loom cover art mainly features background art and not characters. And he stated that you as a character artist, would have created a spectacular cover filled with characters. So I ask you, given your expertise as a character artist, how do you think you would have approached crafting this cover differently? Doing a loom cover? Mm-hmm. Is that what you're saying? Oh, uh, yeah, I probably would have featured the characters. That's, you know, I probably would have had a cloaked figure and put it, you know, I, I, I think the loom cover is beautiful, so... I can't complain about it, but it's it's probably true that I would have found a way to let myself draw like, you know, something that was figurative or even a big face or something in the background if I could have managed it. So that's probably what I would have pitched. Which brings me to my next question. Have you ever seen the cover art for the FM Towns version of Loom? I may have seen it in Mark's interview. Want to show it? So, or is it? This one, exactly. In Mark's interview. The FM Towns version. Yeah, I don't know what that is. I don't recognize what that is. It, 
Yeah. It's a, is that structure in the game? Yeah. Th this, th this structure is the actual loom. And these are yeah. the characters from the game. Okay. I can kind of get it. Okay. I, I recognize the guy's hat. The characters. I don't know. Yeah, that guy's hat is the thing. head that's being cut off in your animation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It looks a little dense. It's not my favorite thing. I think Mark's is better. I agree. But how would you have approached creating the... <laughs> <laughs> Let's go down the speculative path. I probably would have. I mean, like, like Zach, you know, it's, you know, it's a go-to to sometimes give yourself like a central, like a pyramidic kind of composition. Sometimes that gives you a good place to jump off of. Um, so I might've found a way to, I would kind of figure out who, who matters the most. I probably be trying to get Brian to explain, you know, what is it, what matters the most to you or which character do you want to see featured or something like that. So I'd probably be trying to please the, the director of the project. And one of the graphic but advancements. I, I wouldn't have drawn that one you should. I wouldn't have drawn the one you should. I'm still looking for information about the person who actually drew this cover because nobody knows who okay. drew it. Now I'm going to. Because I said that it's going to hurt his feelings if he ever hears this. Next month on Tech Talk yeah. with Daniel, yeah. I'm talking to I'll the artists it. behind the cover. Yeah. Let's let's hear what the Steve Purcell what do you has think to about, say. What do you think about Steve's comments? <laughs> now, one of the technological advancements done in Doom was the addition of dithering to the uh, to the Scum engine. Yeah. And the ability to create shadows or gradients that would appear yeah. as gradients on CRT screens. So, um, how did you? Were you pleased with how things turned out using dithering? Or uh, were you I wasn't still really like... somebody that I wasn't really somebody that used it very much. I think I used it like in transitions. Like, how do I go from gray to black? And I'd probably have some pixels in there that were um kind of reducing in density or something like that mark you know took it to a next level and i don't you know i never tried to approach what he was doing he sort of found yeah but you used it in palettes. some of the shadows in the close-ups yeah and but you know only because you know i'm trying to draw a human face and i've got like salmon pink and bright red and i'm trying to <laughs> figure out how to make that look like a person so you know, how can I neutralize some of that salmon pink with the other colors? And I think that's basically what I was trying to do. But it's very, if you look at my stuff compared to what Mark was doing, my stuff's very minimal, minimal as far as dithering. It's really just trying to find a new, like a transition or a, an extra color that you don't have. Because those original 16 colors were ghastly. I think a lot of the reason why even Indian Monkey Island ended up with so many dark backgrounds because you could always count on black to look the same on everybody's screen and you know, all the yeah, other colors were kind of what what's this what's this kind of tan kind of ochre you know mucilage color what's that going to look like on somebody's you couldn't tell sometimes what you're going to get but when we do like the monkey island stuff you'd be in a cave oh, okay oh thank god there's a cave we could just make it mostly black and put a little bit of information in the edges of it. Now uh, you keep talking about Monkey Allen. So here's Monkey Allen. Yeah, Monkey Allen. So first of all, thank you for creating this iconic cover. You know, us 80s and 90s kids had posters on our walls back when we were kids. And now that we're adults, we no longer have posters. But most of us still have the Monkey Allen poster somewhere around our workspace either yeah. on the table or as a poster on the wall so um i want to thank you sure for all of us i remember it felt like a handful to do this poster because i had done zach and mm -hmm. zach was closer to what my comics looked like um it's mm -hmm. a little more cartoony and i remember i think it was ron that was probably asking for something that was a little more realistic and I don't really, when I look at this, I don't consider it that realistic. I still think it's pretty stylized and cartoony, 
But for me at the time, it was kind of a reach to get to something that was more representational and less of my sort of comic style. So I was really, you know, I wanted to do a good job. I wanted to spend a lot of time on it. I was kind of um, pushing myself a little to try to get to something that I would be really satisfied with. Um, I mean, it's good since it's still around decades later that I spent the time on it. Um, Because that's the danger of everything you do now exists forever. So, you know, people can pull up all your old stuff and see all the warts and things that you didn't spend the time on. So it was nice to get to spend the time on it and it, it was received really well. Yeah, you know, we should be proud of this particular cover art and other cover arts that you worked on are and still like we iconic to this about, thing. Yeah, like we were talking about earlier, it's like, okay, we're sort of limited in the game itself, even in the close-ups, we're limited. So what do we wish this game looked like if we were able to you know, do this whole thing fully fleshed out yeah. and here's what we think it is and here's what we think the main character looks like. And um, I never thought of Guybrush as sort of the nerdy spindly guy that I think they did in the special edition of it. They kind of made him more, more kind of wayfish. Mm -hmm. um, I always thought of him kind of like a Matthew Broderick kind of guy, like every man kind of guy. I don't know if it's, I think Lady Hawk might have been out around that time and Rex. So I, I think he was in that. But and just this, like the cover this art, kind of, you also worked on the background art and the animation in the game. Which yeah, which backgrounds and which animations? Yeah, there is a uh, there is a version of that Monkey Island cover that I've got, um, which makes me think it must have cover thought must have come a lot earlier in the process because the guy brush that I had indicated in the pencil drawing was more like a like a muscly guy mm -hmm. like a regular leading man so I'm trying to think when that would have happened but that was a whole other take on him and it wasn't till we got to this one where he was a little you know more of a you know slight leading man so it was interesting that at some point, I was designing a cover idea that had more of a big you know, burly guy. So you stated in Zach McCracken that they told you which elements were part of the game, and so you knew what to draw on the cover itself. So was this the same with this game, or because it's a game you actually worked on, you knew about yeah. these elements and were a part of their creation yourself? I'm sure. I'm sure Ron had an opinion about it. I'm. I, since I did work on the game, I had thoughts about what I wanted to include. I knew I, you know, I had drawn the big stone monkey background, so I, I always liked that and wanted to include it. Um, mm -hmm. And the cannibals. I think the the pirates are kind of random. I don't know if they, except for Elaine, I don't know the other ones connect directly to any of the characters on screen. Well. But I think I probably made the choice on what's in the composition and Ron, Ron, Ron probably reacted to it. And do you remember where you I think, signed I think that little monkey, in the, the little monkey in the foreground, I think I don't think he's in the game specifically like that. But no, I mean, the monkey, just, again, there's a like, monkey in the game that you need to give him bananas for him to follow you on Monkey Island. So he's in the game. That specific monkey? Like a... Well, a, a monkey gibbon. is in the game. <laughs> Yeah, because there's something about that monkey that almost makes me think, oh, uh, I want to paint a monkey and I want, want to put it right in the middle. That's what that monkey says to me, but it could be, yeah, I'm trying to show the monkey from the gate. Can you sign your name over here? Where is it? On the right. Oh, is on it on the right? Me? Next to, on the right of... Yeah, just trying to get it in somewhere without just writing it across artwork now the fm towns version used a slightly muted color palette did you take part <laughs> in this creative decision i called them up and i said you better mute that artwork because it's too saturated now you know if you know if you spend any time in 
places where things are being reproduced, you can never count on anything looking the same. I don't know that they made a conscious choice to mute it or it's just the way it turned out. So I certainly didn't thing. ask them to mute it. Yeah. Maybe they wanted to differentiate the, the cover art between their releases. One interesting aspect of the VGA versions of both Loom and The Secret of Monkey Island is that the consistency of Cobb's design between the two games is lost in the VGA versions because yeah. each one of the VGA versions was interpreted by a different artist. So given that you probably created the these two, I did, which were... I did the top ones, and I think I probably did the bottom right one. And that's my version of doing a higher res thing and it wasn't you know ian mckaig did that lower left one and ian's like a fantastic um figurative artist so he just blew the doors off on all those close-ups he worked on i mean sometimes people think i did those but you know that was ian and he basically took those simplified close-ups and made sense out of them i mean he had more colors to work with but you know he just has this innate, you know, draftsmanship that that I don't know that I will ever have. And so he he made all that stuff look fantastic. But I believe I did, I think that bottom right one looks like the one, my sort of version of trying to do a goosed up, you know, higher res version of him. From, but from there you go the, with your kind the of SM salmon thousand, pink. From the FM Townsend CD ROM version, you created this one, this close up? I think I did that one. It looks like it looks like I traced over my artwork and tried to make it look fancier. That was a, the best I could do. And then Ian basically kind of found the structure within the faces when he redid his. So it's amazing how close he is to the composition, but he sort of made it his own in the way he interpreted that guy's head, as well as he did with the um, with the uh, guy brush and Elaine and. Any other ones he did? Now, back in the 90s, all of the SCUM programmers okay. who had to go through SCUMU during their training period work with sample characters of Sam and Max. That's right. Way before Hit the Road was in production. That's right. Now, these animations were in the Monkey Island data files. Someone forgot to remove them. And given the limitations, you know, I was not sure that, you know, I'm familiar with the games, with the LucasArts games that came out in 1990 and 1991. And the, the animations were very limited and the sprites were very, very small. And well, do yeah. you think, given those limitations, um, do you think that a Sam and Max game would have been as visually amusing as Hit the Road? Um... Yes, if it was more limited, is that what you're saying? No, if it if you were using these sprites back then, given the limitations of the Scum engine, when I look at these, they don't look that much different to what we ended up with in the game. And I'm trying to even figure out if I drew these or if they what they look like, what the cycle looks like. It's from a comic that I had done. Um, in one of my books, I had a page and it was, uh, you could cut out the frames and make a flip book. And so all these poses are from that little flip book in the, in the comic, Max is right there and Sam kind of squishes his head down. And then when Max comes up, Sam swats him away. So that's what mm -hmm. it looks like these came from. And so I'm, I'm not even sure if I drew on top of that or if somebody else just interpreted those line drawings and made these sprites out of them. Um, I mean, we did redesign them when it came time to do the Sam and Max game. So, exactly. uh, First of all, this is the best kind of brand recognition. Just shove your characters into anything and everything. And <laughs> don't sell the rights to LucasArts. Retain the, right. the license and have them credit you every time. Well... Originally, I think the first uh, kind of brush with that idea was when they asked me if I wanted to do a comic strip for the Adventurer magazine. Mm -hmm. And 
I think in their minds, I would create something original that would just be part of your adventure. And I was kind of not as interested in doing that. I said, eh, I don't really want to do that, but I'll do Sam and Max. And at the time, and maybe the, you know, it was licensing was a simpler kind of environment at the time. And so that was possible to do. I had a lawyer at the time who helped me write that contract just to make sure that I wasn't handing off the rights to anything. And the other thing was if I was doing a parody of one of their games, I made sure the parody was not so specific that I couldn't, you know, consider it part of the Sam Max world. Mm -hmm. So if when I did my sort of Monkey Island takeoff in my first strip, it wasn't the Monkey Island characters, it was pirates in general, and none of the more specific characters to the Monkey Island game. And then one later when we did, you know, Star Wars or whatever, it's like I'd make up my own version of the X-Wings and put like rubber tires on them and make the suits look different enough so that my stuff was like Sam and Max's version of Star Wars. So I wasn't infringing on their copyright and they weren't owning my, my copyright. And so I think that's part of how Sam and Max kind of became part of the culture of um, Lucasfilm games, which is great. It was just neat to have have them sort of folded into that that culture a little bit. And then the other thing that happened over the years was people would put Max, like other designers would put Max into their games. So he would make little cameos in other people's games. People started and looking for them. And then they'd have to credit you. Did they? I don't remember. Because I, I didn't did. ask them to. I remember at one point, LucasArts got kind of nervous because it might have been at the point when I had a deal to do a TV show. And so um, it might have made them nervous about including the characters. I think they were discouraging their designers from including Max in, the, in their games because now it was sort of part of this other entity that maybe i didn't own all of i think they were worried about and so they presented me with this document that, that was a little overreaching i'd say like um something about how if max was in somebody else's game like i'm just giving them all the rights to that max image and it was just tr just try to carve it out so cleanly that it was just you know, giving them a lot of slack and a lot of cover in case I went berserk later and tried to sue them or something. I looked at the contract and I didn't like it. So I just never signed it. And I think they just told their designers not to put Max in. And then they just put them in anyway. They put the Maxes in all their... But it was already in several promotions. games. Yeah, but I could see... I mean, I could see where the legal department would go, uh-oh, maybe we shouldn't be doing this because someday he'll come back or somebody who ends up owning my franchise will come back and take them to task for doing that or something like, which is something that is possible. It could happen. Well, you might be surprised but. to hear what LucasArts did years later, but we'll discuss <laughs> this a bit <laughs> later in the conversation. But, but as far as these sprites, yeah, I just, I don't know that I drew those. It looks like they're interpreted from the comic, but um, maybe I did. I'm not sure. Who knows? Moving on to Monkey Island 2, out of yeah. all of the Monkey Island games, the, the second one is my personal favorite. I can vividly remember going to the computer game store in summer 1992 and asking my mom to buy me a copy of the game, which stood on one of the shelves. It yeah. was my first time seeing the cover art, and I was both amazed and slightly frightened by how incredibly realistic. <laughs> how, how old were you? I was eight. <laughs> That's great. And the cover art effectively captures the shift in atmosphere and tone between this game and its predecessor. So when you worked on the cover art for the second game, what different approach did you take compared to the, the first one? Um. The first was the medium. I remember uh, Ron had said early on, I think it was probably before I started drawing, that he wanted to look like a storybook, like Treasure Island or 
you know, something you might see printed on a book. And so it made me feel like it wanted to be a little richer maybe than the, than the first one. And so I had made the choice that I was going to do an oil painting. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot more work. And I kind of set aside about a month to do it. And Colette Michaud, who is the head of the art department at the time, she uh, was doing the design for the box. So she um, was giving me sort of art direction on what the box itself would look like. And then she ended up modeling for the different parts of this. So I have photos of her like doing the guy brush pose. And then I have photos of her with the big wig on with the pirate hat. And then I have a, I, in my office, I had a skeleton, like size plastic skeleton. So I put the wig and the hat on the skeleton and photographed that so I could get the lighting and stuff like that. And, uh, and so I just wanted to do something that was nice and dense and rich looking and um, still that it had humor in it because I always feel like, you know, even though it's not cartoony, it feels like it was always meant to be whimsical. So that's why LeChuck has like a dead bird for his plume in his hat. And that there's a monkey mm -hmm. getting agitated on the side. The, the voodoo doll's kind of silly looking. And so there's, it's, you know, it's always got like a little sense of humor on the edge. I always felt like Monkey Island was less meant to be like a cartoon and more meant to be like Monty Python or something like Monty Python and the Holy Grail, where it's real, real characters doing silly things. So again, it was an example of us trying to create what the world looks like. So when you're playing the game, you feel like, like, okay, I'm going to bring this, bring, bring this with me into the, whatever we're able to depict in the game. So Colette modeled to provide lighting reference for this yeah. drawing. So I have a picture of her in a, in a long coat doing that agonized pose as well as the LeChuck. But let me ask you this. <laughs> What's the light source in this drawing? I think it's coming from the lower left somewhere. I don't know what it is. Maybe there's a lantern there or something like that. There's some backlight from the moon. For me, it was just doing something that's got But like, the moon is behind drama. the logo. Yeah, the moon's behind the logo. So there's a little bit of edge behind. If you look on the right side of LeChuck, you see he's got some blue light coming from behind. And so in my mind, there's some lantern or something down on the deck off, off screen. Now I know. It's been bugging me for three decades. <laughs> so thanks. <laughs> Somebody picked up a lantern, set it down there so we could have this moment. Probably Ron Gilbert. Yeah, Ron's, Ron's down there with the lantern. Now, here is some concept art you designed for the cover of Monkey 2. Yeah. First of all, let me say that these sketches are, are, are truly impressive, as each one of them could easily pass as the final cover art for the game. And, and moreover, it appears that Despite these being created as concept art, a substantial amount of effort went into crafting the fine details and the coloring. Was was this your typical approach when working on, um, on cover art? Did you produce multiple probably, high quality concept art sketches for project leads to evaluate? I would always do something in color and usually it would be colored pencil because that's very quick. Uh, I think in this case, since I knew I was going to spend the time on an oil painting, we just wanted to kind of root out the right idea. And so I spent more time. I remember there was one concept where there's kind of a castle. And so that's what I tried to get into the one on the right hand side. I think mm -hmm. the middle one they used on the limited run mm -hmm. box set. Exactly. Um, yeah. I remember telling them at some point, you know, that's not really meant to be a cover, but you know, there it is on because if you look at these close up, they're very, uh, it's like indicated rather than kind of detailed. Mm -hmm. So they're all designed to put the basic shapes and the concept forward without, you know, getting caught up in the, in the nuts and bolts of the detail. And it, as you can see, the original idea of the, the final cover had Elaine in it. And so I just felt like she was extra. So she just fell out. So it's really like, what's the best? 
what's the best approach for this box or what's the most clear kind of take for the box and and the one that won out i think is the clearest and needs the least sort of content around it to explain what it is and who was responsible for making the ultimate decision among the three covers um, and and what do you believe led to that selection given that this cover art features a scene that's not even in the game um I don't think, you know, I don't think that's critical that the scene needs to be in the game. Um, it's probably, Ron probably had a lot to do with the choice. Colette probably had had a lot to do with the choice because she had to make a package around it. So, and I probably had my preference. So that's probably, you know, everybody's decision weighing in. Probably Ron would have the final say. And could you elaborate on the specific aspects of the game you actually worked on apart from the cover? Um, apart from the cover, I did mm -hmm. some of the backgrounds. I remember we were transitioning from doing all digital art to doing uh, color art that could be scanned. And so Peter Chan, he was using markers and he was really good. I don't know if he had had experience with markers previously in his commercial work, but he was a natural using markers and it was a really quick medium for him. And he, so, so he ended up, I think, taking on most of the backgrounds. So there were certain ones that I did and I was, I had first started out trying to paint them. I, I have, I still have one of them. Um, but I painted them the way I painted these, um, comps. Um, and that, but it was more time consuming. So I sort of took on markers as well. And I just felt like uh, my marker skills weren't up to what Peter's were. So I did the best I could. And I, I'm happy with the backgrounds. I think I did, might have done the thinking, I might have done the kind of the ship village where the ships are kind of floating and there's a bridge going into it. Um, there's certain ones I could look at and I can say, oh yeah, I did that. And then other ones, oh yeah, Peter, Peter did that. You know what? Let's do um, just that. I did that long animation of the, or long in order to create it was the, uh, the guy that was restored from bones and it's like a spell okay. that pulls him from his bony self to his. Okay. These are all the backgrounds in McAllen too. Let me just zoom in. Correct. All of them? All of them. I don't think I did. I did, did that you do one. this bar? I did that one. The one above it is the one that was like the first one that I painted when you see back up. Go that one. That was the one that I, I painted it in um, the same like water based medium that I did those comps in. I think I know about that one. Oh, we can continue scrolling. I can't remember who we else was doing bar. backgrounds. We have the close-up for Largo's pit. And we have the kitchen. We have the hotel. That looks like one of mine. I think I did a lot of those interiors because I was sort of trying to figure out what an upside-down version of the inside of the ship would be like. I don't think I did that one. It doesn't look like me. Oh, maybe. Or here is the guy you resurrect. Like maybe. From the ashes. Yeah, so that animation probably took me a week and a half or something to draw. And because I was rendering every frame, because he eventually mm -hmm. turns from, I think he goes from that to like a skeleton to like a guy. And so I was like, every frame was like a painting and somebody at some point told me that that animation was bigger than the whole first monkey island game i don't know if that's true or not but probably i like the idea of it well it's a good thing you spend time on this animation because it's the most yeah. memorable one in the game <laughs> and there were things that i did like because i had designed the first guy brush uh, i think i did that one of the the skull it's like my version of a another monkey thing i did a skull building so i think i did that i did that oh. interior of the um the, the voodoo, voodoo queen. lady 
Yeah, I did those those little things in the foreground. I remember. I did not do that. Did you did do not this? Do that because I'm trying so. to see a pattern. Maybe maybe you always add things in the foreground to give things a more. <laughs> that could be give them depth. Because I I did not do that one. Did not do the maps. Did not do that. Did you work only on the first part of the game? I'm wondering because for whatever reason, it seems like I was in and out of the office at that point. I wasn't coming in as much as I had previously. I can't remember why. I can't remember what else I might have been doing instead of that. And I don't know that Peter did all these. I thought that we had somebody else doing some of these backgrounds. But I'm not sure. Not sure if Paul. So in my conversation was there with Larry Ahern, one of his uh, problems with the game was the fact that it didn't have one um, artistic style, because yeah. several artists I heard worked on that. several several things. And so, what do you think? I think I mean that's true, and I think it's because it was a transitional game because we we're going from all digital art which because of the medium of it i think it helps it pull together because it's all drawn the same way where we're going to this new idea of painting things and then putting them on screen so now you're sort of dependent on different people's painting skills like i was telling you i thought peter was better marker painter than i was um so that might be part of the disparity in the imagery um as far as the sensibility like i said i always thought that the monkey island world was meant to be kind of like monty python and the holy grail where it's it's just real people sort of in a silly fantastic or less than it's meant to be a cartoon um and i heard larry saying he had made the conscious choice to go to more of a cartoony kind of slapstick style for Mm -hmm. his game and i think that makes total sense and he totally you know achieved that i think that was a great goal i think he's a really thoughtful artist that he made that choice to okay here's what i think it is and i'm gonna make this choice and i'm gonna make sure that all the visual cues are in line with that so i don't think we had the foresight to know where we would be working on monkey island too i didn't know i don't think that anybody anticipated that there might be a need for an art director or somebody to kind of manage the different looks i think at the time we we're going wow that's cool wow let's put this that's cool and everybody was kind of doing the best they could and whatever sort of didn't shake out looking the same was just because we were almost like we were just in a new frontier at the, at the time it was a big deal that not be drawing a background digitally and to be scanning it instead yeah it was the first game uh, where you used the scanner yeah i don't know if, uh how do you feel about me moving the camera but i can show you the monkey island painting in my rear you have to show me the painting okay so I'm gonna turn my camera over here I, I brought it in so that you could see the scale of it it's real space so, so this is the original drawing it's a painting. It's an oil painting. So this is the original painting? Uh, yeah, I spent one month on it. So um, after I brought it home, after it was used for publication, I wanted to hang it up. And so I was walking down the street past some cheap frame shop. And this painting is two by three feet. And I was going... Oh, I wonder if they have a frame. And I look and there's a frame that's this, this frame was just leaning up on the sidewalk in their display. And I'm going, wow, that's the perfect frame for this painting. And what would you ever buy that frame for if you don't have a pirate painting at all? Like, you're not really going to put a picture of grandma in that frame. It's just such a weird overzealous frame. I decided to put this painting in it, but, and it's been in there ever since. I mean, this thing is worth like a million dollars. You are aware of that, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. I've, I've had offers on it. For me, as I think if I sold it, 
I would sell it and I'd have the some amount of money, which I would eventually spend. But who knows if I'll ever do another giant pirate painting. So I might as well just keep it. Maybe my kids will sell it or maybe <laughs> if I wait too long. Yeah, if you want to buy this painting, click the link down below. Right. <laughs> Let's get a line on going on this interview. Now, the year after Monkey Island 2, it seems that a lot of ports came out with you credited on them with Loom and Monkey Allen 2 and Secret of Monkey Allen and Last Crusade, the graphic adventure. So the only original property you were credited on was Defenders of Dinotron City. All right. But can you tell about that project? Yeah. I didn't really work on the game, but Gary had uh, come up with the idea. He said, you know, oh, absolutely uh, old, old school comic book fan. He loves this sort of fantastical, goofy superheroes and wanted to create something around that so he was working on that game design but asked me since i had done some comics to come in and help sort of design some of the characters i can't remember if i did the character designs or if we worked with somebody else doing them i remember doing final art for the characters and helping him sort of write descriptions and things like that of them so it was fun because i wasn't you know laboring over digital art i was really you know helping him visualize this property and gary like he always has a lot of great ideas like we worked years later on different things that he would have ideas for and i would just basically implement them and you know he hear my feedback but he was always very easy going about stuff that i would contribute to his ideas so i used to call gary the the king of the high concept because he always had millions of ideas for animated shows and things like that and so you worked on, on the game itself, you worked on the cover and the manual art, right? Yeah, and, um, and then there was an animated pilot that was created. So I think I didn't, you know, they had their own writers that were doing that. So we must have looked at some of the, you know, character designs and things like that. And... Um, I think the idea was they'd do a show and then maybe the game would the game would sort of launch the show um keep that going but the, it never went past the pilot one cool little nugget is in the show i think the cast i think whoopi goldberg is in the cast mm -hmm. i think she's one of the characters but um originally for the mad scientist um I forget his name at the moment. Uh, we had Christopher, Christopher Walken doing his voice. Yeah. Exactly. And I just remember hearing the takes. I can't for the life of me think why they changed it out. Maybe it wasn't as stereotypical as a cartoon. Mad science. I just remember his, I'm a doctor. I just remember his kind of gruff, <laughs> you know, that Christopher Walken take on the lines with kind of breathy, manic energy. And it was real. It's a, it's been so long ago that it's it's almost inconceivable to think of Christopher Walken, you know, doing the voice for a deep company cartoon character. But you know, if only it could have happened, we could have gotten a full performance. Out of Maybe it. one day Christopher Walken's auditions <laughs> would unearth, and we'd finally yeah. hear them ourselves. Yeah, there must be some more lines somewhere. I wonder who has that. I guess Deep is that is that company still in business? EIC or archives yeah, we, to dig through, looking for old stuff. Yeah, exactly. Because a, a few a few years after that, Christopher Walken played a character in a computer game called Ripper that we're currently playing, oh, yeah. and it's as weird as you might think it is. So yeah, does he do a take, or is it just somebody that wanted a Christopher Walken sounding Christopher Walken, or does he do a no? It's an FMV game, it. so it's actually Christopher Walken. Like Christopher Walken acting as Christopher mm -hmm. Walken. He's not even well, playing a character. He's just playing himself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and this one, he was like going off the rails. So it's really fun to hear him doing that. You probably know that The Dig went through four different iterations before the one that was released. Yeah. Now, although you're not officially credited on any of them, during your time at LucasArts, you likely saw something you likely saw it being worked on or heard discussions about its trouble development process 
What can you tell us about the dig? All I remember, and it's funny because I was hearing Larry talking about the dig. Somehow I never ended up working on it, I guess. But it was always sort of lurking in the background. There was always some version of the dig kind of lumbering along somewhere. So I was aware of it and you'd see stuff from time to time. You go, oh, that's cool. Or, you know, Spielberg's, you know, says this about that. And so there was always a presence of it. And mm-hmm. I don't remember, it wasn't like I was lobbying to work on it or anything. It just seemed like something that was always around for a while. And I don't know how many years it existed before some version Six. actually came out. But I remember, yeah, I remember there were always different versions of it in progress. So I, I don't remember specifically tracking the different project leads for it, but I remember it being handed off from one to the to the next over time. So was it the running gag at LucasArts? I don't know that anybody was making fun of it or anything like that. I, I think it's just, I just remember it. You know, it was irresistible for them to want to take on because it was a Spielberg property. And I think that's why it lingered for so long and they put so much effort into it because it would have been, you know, in there. I'm sure in the minds of marketing, it would be a really great thing to have a Spielberg property that's exclusive to the game company. So it's, I could see the logic of wanting, wanting it to come out and be a success. Because it's one of my favorite LucasArts adventure games and yeah. the people who actually worked on it hated it. The people who didn't work on it hated it. And it seems like I'm the only one who actually appreciates this game for what it is. Sometimes when people work on things, they take takes forever to be able to appreciate it as a consumer of it or an audience member. And, you know, I've worked on film projects and it's like, there's a, there's quite a long stretch of time before you can actually look at it like a viewer instead of somebody that, Oh, I remember that review where we were looking at that thing and making a choice about this or that it's, it takes a while sometimes. And so even some kind of some movies that are, have a tortured production process end up being really good movies. So it's not, Maybe we need to wait for its 30th anniversary. (laughs) Yeah. When will that be? In two years. So two years from now, we'll celebrate the 30th anniversary of the dig. And I hope to interview everyone again. And I hope that everyone will tell me how much they love the game and how much they appreciate them working on such a masterpiece. Because they'll all have lost their memories and they'll have forgotten anything that happened at that point. Speaking of 30th anniversaries, Sam and Max see the road is marking its 30th anniversary this November. Can you believe Crazy. it's been three decades? I could not. Well, you should. I cannot believe it. Before the production of Sam and Max see the road started, Sam and Max were already well-known figures at LucasArts. The employees were familiar with them since they were introduced to them like we saw during their training at SCUMU. That, that was your MO at the time. Catch them while they're young. And moreover, uh, LucasArts fans were acquainted with, uh, with Sam and Max through their appearances in The Adventure and the various cameos in the games. So was, at, at that stage, was it more or less expected that a Sam and Max game would eventually be created? Or I don't did you think still there have to present the, the idea to them? No, I don't think I don't think that was any on anybody's radar really to oh man, we gotta make a Sam and Max game. I don't think that was the thinking around it at all. It was true, I often say that the characters sort of became unofficial mascots at, at the company because um you know, we had like a little like tiki's of them in Monkey Island and we they they made little appearances elsewhere. We had the adventurer strips and we, you know, we actually had stuff in the company store, like T-shirts in the company store and pins and things like that. That was my stuff, which was cool. So it kind of felt like they had this weird little connection to to the company. Um, but it really was, it seemed like that um, president at the time, Kelly Flock, he, he was the one that first asked me and 
what I heard was the circumstances surrounding it was um, Mike Stemley and Sean Clark were needing a project to lead. And uh, I think they were thinking about pitching an Indiana Jones, maybe another Indiana Jones game. And I think everybody was looking at that going, oh, that seems like a handful, maybe. It, and we need something to get going sooner and maybe it needs to be finished sooner. I don't know if it felt like there were some parameters around what it was going to be. And I think it might have been Kelly that, you know, suggested Sam and Max because those guys knew it and it was kind of an easy get as far as um, possibly adapting it for a game. And Kelly approached me, hey, you want to make a game? And here's what we want out of the rights and, you know, here's here's what we want to do going forward. And he, he told me he read uh, the comics to his daughter as bedtime stories. And so I think a lot of the luck I've had in my career is that I had fans in high places where somebody who was able to make a decision about something had read the comics and they connected to them for whatever reason. So it was a case of, oh, he just likes this comic and he would like to see it as a game. And and LucasArts is offering this licensing deal that's not too overreaching. It's like, we don't care about toys or ancillary rights. And it probably would be unheard of now for a company not to even ask for that stuff. But at the time, it's like, we just want to make a game. And for me, it's like any kind of deal like that I go into, it's like, okay, what do you want to make? Who's making it? Do the people that are making it understand what it is? So I don't have to explain it to them. In this case, it was true. Mike and Sean knew, knew the characters. Um, so they don't need to be, you know, kind of explained at every step of the way what this should be like. Um, and then my other stipulation, whenever I look at a licensing deal, is so like when you're done with it, then what? Like, like I always want to get the thing back when, the company is done doing something with it. And so it was a very agreeable contract and Kelly was great that he wanted to do it. And it was, for me, it was just, it blew my mind that a George Lucas company was licensing something for me. It seemed crazy. Yeah. But, uh, you know, and, and that, that was cool. LucasArts tried to acquire the rights from you because they kept oh. on licensing a uh, seven max from you. For the adventure and for basically every uh, cameo in their games the but no no the adventure deal was just always a one-off it's like each each one of those trips was its own thing and uh so it was never there's never any kind of ongoing contract out as far as that as far as the the contract i mentioned before about max's appearance i think it was just them being nervous that if they put my guy in their stuff that I might sue them someday. Hey, you owe me all this money because you put my guy in your stuff. Um, so I think that's where that came from. There was never any kind of offer. Hey, we want to buy the whole thing. I never heard that or even a, a hint of that. But there was a time after we had done the game, We, me and Dave, Grossman after Sam and Max hit the road was done. There was talk of whether there'd be a sequel and me and Dave worked on an idea for a while. Um, and oh, and me and Dave and Ron one, one time we went out for a dinner at Chuck E. Cheese and talked about like a, uh, more like a portable version of like a, um, Ron always had this dream of doing a, a, like a mini game that you would buy at the counter when you're in the game store. It's like, oh, mm -hmm. it's a sleeve with a, it's a whole little game. And it sort of was the dawn of the idea of doing something that was serialized or doing something that would ultimately be like a downloadable game. And so I remember me and Ron and Dave went and had Chuck E. Cheese pizza and, and we're trying to come up with ideas for what, what a Sam and Max mini game might be like. But that I, I don't remember if somebody's told us to stop doing it or if we just lost interest. And as far as the one I worked on with Dave, a possible sequel, the, at the time, I think it was Jack Sorensen. He just wasn't interested in doing it. So Ty. this was immediately after Hit the Road? I don't know how long after. I was still around, so I think it was around. 
at some point I was kind of in and out. I, I might've left to do the um, cartoon show by then and maybe came back to work on the idea for the game. Cause the cartoon show, what year was that? 97, I think. Mm-hmm. So there would have been a run up of almost a year to, to the cartoon show coming out. So I might've been home working on that. Not yeah, sure. but Ron wasn't uh, at the company then, so. So if if there was a conversation with me and Ron and Dave, it might have been a lot earlier than it would have been before he had left. So you guys were talking about downloadable content before the internet was yeah even and not downloadable, but like today. like here's something that's not 40 hours of gameplay. It's like two hours of gameplay kind of thing, which sort of was set the stage for. You know, the stuff that Telltale ended up doing, which is more, you know, episode based. Now, the CD ROM version of the CD ROM version of the game has an extra scene in which we see a full screen animation of Sam replacing the stand with Conway oh, Bumpus's right. toupee with an eggplant in an obvious reference okay. to Raiders of the Lost Ark. Right. Were you aware that this scene will be recreated for the CD ROM version? And if so, why was this, this scene chosen specifically? You mean, like, it, or are you asking me if it was a new thing we added or was it something? No, that I know it's a new thing you added this. because I talked to Anson Ju who created this animation specifically yeah. for the CD ROM version. What I'm asking you is if you <laughs> were the one who decided which scene. Isn't it true it, that you created an extra scene, right? Um, <laughs> no, no. Um, What's the question again? <laughs> now, and ask me without screaming one? in my face. No. What's, what's the, <laughs> why was this scene chosen specifically? It must have been that we were able to move bigger areas of the screen around or something. I, it seems like something that maybe we wanted to do and we couldn't do it before because we couldn't move something around. Was, uh, and I can't remember, I heard Larry talking about, you know, when he would get to do big animations that were sort of featured on the back of the box. Like one of the Larry's I heard him talking about was when Sam and Max kind of tumble off of the ball or mm-hmm. twine. Exactly. They get really big and look. It was always great to have those because Larry would add so much charm into that. I don't know if Larry's a trained animator, but he would get so much charm and life into that kind of stuff. So, and I, and I was going to ask you, hey, do you remember if that one was in the disc version? Because that seemed like a pretty big chunk of was in the uh, floppy disk version as well. It was? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's hard for me to remember what, what could be in the floppy disk version or what had to be in the CD ROM version. Um, for me, I would think that that, you know, tumbling down would be almost as, you know, using as much information as, as the close up head. So I don't know. Maybe it's just something we wished we had and we asked. Anson to do it. I'm not sure. And did you take part in the creation of the puzzles themselves, or were, were the puzzles designed mainly by yeah, Mike there was, and I mean, Sean? No, we were all in the puzzle. You know, those guys did the heavy lifting of making everything work, and you know, most of the writing and stuff like that. For me, it was like, how can I spread myself thin over all this material, and so how can I? make it feel as much like what I think the comic is because it was really the first time I'd ever collaborated with anybody on Sam and Max stuff out, you know, the comic was all me, so I get to do whatever I want. So in this case, it's like, oh, here's a whole crew of people all trying to move the same direction. And so for me, it was like, what can I contribute to this part? What can I contribute to this part? Oh, I think I'll do Sam and Max's walk cycles because I think I know what those should look like and I'll do some of the um, special case things I'll do when they fight for the phone because I think I know what that looks like and I just had an idea in my head to how the you know the Cushman brothers or Siamese twin guys I wanted to see see them walk like that kind of flip around I believe I animated all of that um, and then kind of sharing the duties with the rest of the crew but trying to have my toes in a lot of different different aspects of it 
So, you know, we talked about puzzle. For me, sort of the design is in my mind, it's like, what's fun or where do you want to be or what, you know, what kind of fun place do you want to be in? And then what are the puzzle opportunities within that? So we would be in rooms kind of talking about that stuff. And did you take an active part in the auditions for the voice actors? Um, I remember getting a box of tapes. I remember having a box of tapes dropped on my desk and just going through them in my mind, but not, not directing any auditions, just hearing. And I don't even know if the auditions were people doing lines from the game. They might've just been people's demo tapes. So I do remember listening to a bunch of those and, and there was, you know, when I would think of Sam's voice early on, um, before there was ever a chance of seeing an am animated version, it was always like, oh, he's Donald Sutherland. He would sound like Donald Sutherland. And, you know, it's not like game companies were asking Hollywood actors to do anything at the time. Um, so that was off the table, but there was a actor named Steve Landisberg who used to be on the Barney Miller TV show. And he had this very laconic kind of, you know, relaxed style of speaking. And then I remember thinking, oh, he'd be a great Sam because he's, you know, he's not overly excitable. He's sort of the opposite of that. And I think we reached out to him as agent wouldn't even ask him. Like it just seemed so obscure to them that they weren't interested. In talking about. And so who we ended up with for Sam, and it was a different take than I would have thought was Bill Farmer, who was the official voice of Goofy, but does a million other voices. And his Sam, if I try to imitate Sam, I try to imitate Bill Farmer's Sam. Well, it's like a marginally volatile hostage situation, Max. So it's got this kind of Jack Webb, who was an actor in the 60s who would do a cop show mixed with this, you know, Johnny Carson, uh, you know, our historic late night um host kind of thing but it had this kind of right quality to it but kind of observational at the same time and it kind of pinched up in the back of his his mouth and he just sounded really funny to me and sort of beside it all like he wasn't overstating it which i thought was awesome about about uh his take on sam and it took me years i wasn't in any of the recording sessions with him um and years later, I met him at San Diego. It must have been at least 10 years later. And he remembered lines from the game, which is amazing to me because you can imagine how many lines that guy says every day of his working career. So he, he had a fondness for the, for the game. So that's great to hear. Well, all of us remember the lines from the game. Yeah, but I'm, I'm talking about a working actor who goes in and pounds nails all day long with lines from, you know, a million things that he must be working on. Maybe he's a fan of the game. But, yeah, but that's Secretly. great that you said that. Because I played the game yesterday all the way through. I, last time yeah. I played it, was, I think, was a year ago or so. I tend to yeah. play it every, every year from beginning to, to end. And I remember every line as if I'm eight years old again. Uh-huh. So... Yeah, I do that yeah. with movies where my wife sometimes says, how can you watch that movie all, all over and over again? And for me, it's like, how, you know, when you listen to a symphony, you don't just listen to it once and then never listen to it again. For me, so much of it is the sound of it and the rhythm of it and sort of getting used to the pacing and, oh, they're going to say this thing then. And it's, for me, it feels like music. Like I'll put movies on when I'm drawing, when I'm not watching the movie, I'm listening to it. And I sort of get used to the pace of certain ones I've seen dozens and dozens of times. And I just want to sort of be in it that way. Yeah, I agree. The, with, with movies and with computer games, that's why, you know, Twitch is so popular. At first, I wondered why would anyone be interested in watching anyone else play a game online? Like... <laughs> Why would I watch anyone play a LucasArts game when I can play it myself? But there's something mm -hmm. magical about it because, like you said, it you're listening to the music and to the pronunciation of the words, and there are lines that are imprinted in your brain. Mm -hmm. 
And all of this together makes for a wonderful experience, even as yeah. just white noise in the background mm -hmm. while you're doing something else. Absolutely. You're credited in the special thanks section of the Sega CD port of Rebel Assault. Do you remember why you were thanked in that specific port and not in any of the other versions of the game? Rebel Assault, wow. Rebel Assault, Sega CD. Yeah, I'm just trying to think of any possible connection I would have had to Rebel Assault, except that my uh, eventual wife ended up in it as a character. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I looked at some artwork or... You know, I think some of those thanks would just get, you know, there'd be some obscure thing you did or a conversation or something like that. And it would make you end up with a thank you or a, some credit, which is always kind on the part of the developers. But <laughs> I have no idea what it is. Maybe they read a Seven Max comic during the development Could of be. the game and, and wanted to thank you for it. Or they come to you and, hey, can you fix this screen or something like that? I don't know. What, something like that. So, something skipping ahead better. two years, and we find ourselves in 1996. And it seems that Mortimer and the Riddles of the Medallion, which came mm -hmm. out in 1996, was the first game in which the computer graphics finally caught up with your illustration abilities. And for the first time, the cover art looks exactly like the in-game graphics. <laughs> what are your recollections from that project? Um, I remember it was challenging because the technology was a challenge to, um, you know, the, the kind of action part of it because it has to be out, uh, on a track. So it, you don't have like free, free roaming ability. So it, you have to kind of design to that limitation and, you know, you know, being able to move the character on the screen that much. I think it was, and it was also kind of a hybrid because some of it had that kind of CG look and then other parts were 2D drawn. Mm -hmm. So we hadn't gotten to the place where everything was one or the other. Yeah, for me, it was just trying to, hey, how can I help with the story and help create this character and uh, assist Colette to finding the, the, what the voice of of this game is it's funny because she'll hear once in a while from some somebody who's a super fan of, of mortimer and uh it's always fun for her to like hear somebody that oh man i played that when i was a little kid and, and it bonded me you know, i bonded to it um so it was a weird it was a sort of weird uh off ramp for for uh, lucas arts just because it was different from what they had done previously, but she and, and eventually went over to Lucas Learning and helped start Lucas Learning, and they sort of you know everything was designed specifically for that sort of uh, educational market. Well, you may not Still be aware the, of it, but the the engine that runs Morimar is the same one that runs Rebel Assault. Yeah. Yeah, so they are, I think they were able to squeeze everything they could out of it. Yeah, I think that they had to like base it on something in order to try to get that action aspect. It was a rail it shooter, fun to do. so whoever was around in his teens back in 1995 played Rebel Assault 2, and kids that were much younger played Mortimer, and they all enjoyed like, playing using yeah. the same engine. It's cool. It's going to work out. Moving on to Curse of Monkey Island, you're one of the very few people who are credited on all three of the first Monkey Island games. In Curse, you're specifically credited for concept art. Could you elaborate a bit on the concept art you provided for the project? Yeah, I did a little bit. I did basically what I would call a handful of concept drawings, and it was maybe a couple of rounds. And Larry had already decided he was in this sort of, um, uh, I heard him describe it as stuff that was not, didn't have like, uh, volume. So on. it wasn't so much like we were doing previously. It's more stuff that might have a, 
looser kind of contour to it. So I was kind of uh, finding myself uh, look, hunting for that, what that style might be. I think that guy brush at the bottom is sort of as close to that as I got and the Elaine. I think my mm-hmm. the other stuff sort of looks more like my stuff normally looks. So I was hunting for that. Oh, like, oh, the eyes are a little further apart than you'd want or things like that where it was trying to get closer to what Larry had in his, in his head. So it was fun to do it because the it was a challenge and it's something that was different, but I knew I wasn't going to be on the project. So for me, it was basically just exploring. There's some different angles on some of these guys. And I don't know if we had had the burning beard for LeChuck before that. So it was fun to kind of play with that. It did so- the, um, Stan. What's funny is um, Stan, the original Stan, Stan right? The salesman. Yeah, Stan. Mm-hmm. In the first game, I'd done his animation because Rob wanted like a used car dealer guy that was on like cable TV ads. And years later, I think it was like two or three years ago, like Arby's did this weird throwback where they used that animation for one of their ads. They, I think it was Arby's and it was like, here's my guy. And it's almost like paper animation, but it's like this thing that I drew all those years ago, all those decades ago being used for some advertising because they were like tapping into these obscure pop culture references for the ad. You should have sued them. (laughs) I don't have any ownership. I do have ownership of Sam and Max. You see that that's the great thing about the way you handled the Sam and Max property. The fact that uh, people like Ron Gilbert had to fight Disney and LucasArts for years to get the Monkey Island property back. And even now, when he created Return to Monkey Island, they didn't give him the rights for the game. They just, they licensed Monkey Island to yeah. him. While you got to uh, retain your rights for Seven Max all this time. So kudos on that. You, you had he, a great lawyer. I think even that, like the fact that Ron was able to do that game, I think it was more likely now than it would have been if it was under ownership of the previous version of LucasArts, just because because it's part of Disney now, I think they kind of look look at it as, is there any fun, anything viable here to send us some cash our way? So I think maybe he had a better shot of having that deal at all because it was sort of a new generation of ownership for that. There's one executive producer, Craig Derrick, who yeah. is in charge of all of that. And he used to be at uh, at LucasArts, and now he's at Disney. And he's yeah, he's a major part in the revival of uh, of the Monkey Island franchise back in two thousand nine yeah. with the special editions and the Tales of Monkey Island with Telltale, and now Return to Monkey Island. Yeah, I mean, I think it felt like for a while that maybe LucasArts was sort of sitting on that legacy and not not making use of it, and so feels like. That's great that Rod was able to go back there and revisit that, even if he you know, can't take ownership of it. It's like, here, go play in this world that you created. Around the same time, you decided to leave LucasArts. Why did you decide to leave, and what was the last project you worked on there? I thought Mortimer was the last thing, because I was kind of left by then. I wasn't, I wasn't ever really an employee. I was always a contractor. So mm-hmm. I would kind of come and go, especially in the last years. And I think Mortimer was kind of like a, a freelance project that I came back to work on. But I don't know that I was working on a lot of stuff at that point anyway. So I, I, I want to well, say had the that concept Mortimer's art probably for listening. Curse and Mortimer. Yeah. Mortimer was more, I mean, I'd spent more time on it because I was writing stuff for it and and doing more kind of uh, comprehensive uh, concepts and things like that. So I feel like there was more effort to that where I felt like I was just basically dipping my toe into the Monkey Island stuff at that point. And they just asked me for a few sketches, but we didn't follow up on it. And they did ask me to paint the cover for that one. The only reason I didn't do it was because it had such a specific style, which, you know, I love the 
Larry made a stand and figured out what his style was. And for me at the time, I felt like, oh, if I do a cover for this, I'm just aping somebody else's style where in the previous one, it's like, we, you know, we're sort of limited within the game. So here's your chance to do this elaborate thing where that one felt more like I would just be copying somebody else's stuff rather than kind of bringing something new to it. So that's the only reason I declined to paint that cover. Well, they used your cover art as reference because in the first Monkey Island, the scene takes place in the daytime. And in the second Monkey Island, it takes place in nighttime. And so when they worked on the third game, then Bill Tiller created it in twilight time. <laughs> was there a conscious thought to the lineup when he was doing that? Well, Bill, Bill told me that there was a conscious thought. Maybe it was a coincidence, and then he invented the story. Who knows? Yeah. That's what I should have done with the web story. I should have just gone along with what you had heard already. Exactly. Now, after your departure from LucasArts, how did you proceed with your career? Uh, what year are you talking about? Let's see. 1997, 1997. Yeah, 1997. So, I think our the cartoon show came out in 97, 98. So, I would have mm -hmm. been working. I think I, at the time, I lived around the corner from Skywalker Ranch. I was up in West Marin living in a barn and working on the cartoon show from my home. They'd get these big levels of uh, artwork and I'd like make notes on it, do some storyboard sketches and things like that and script changes and talking to the, you know, story editor over the phone for hours and hours, just picking through it. And that took a lot of my time for most of a year, I would think. So that was probably the next big thing I spent time on. I did another comic when I lived out there and I can't. Remember how that feathers in? There was a comic that I remember drawing. It was Sam Max on the moon, Mad Day on the Moon, I think it was called. And I think I worked on that when I was living in that barn, West Marine. So it must have been in that time, time frame somewhere. And were you worried that you might have to significantly tone down Sam and Max when you started working on the TV series for Fox Kids? Oh, we, to the extent yeah, that they would do. become entirely distinct from Good. their comic counterparts? No, you do have to think about that. Um, it's just a thing that, you know, if it's designed for a younger audience, it's just something you would do and you would expect to do. And I did expect that that would be the case, that we wouldn't have the, like, waving their guns around and stuff like that. So what I chose to do instead was say... You know, when I was working with the crew and the and Dan Smith, the the story editor, it's like let's preserve the weirdness of the comic because the comic's very weird. And so, if we could keep that alive in the TV show, I felt like you could forgive not having some of the more adult kind of violence and things like that, as long as it was goofy and strange enough. Um, and I think we got to that point. It's funny. When, when it first came out, people that were hardcore fans of the comic were, oh, this watered down for TV. But then they would go on and say, but I can't believe they let you do this. And then they list some, you know, they recite some joke that they heard in the, in the TV show that they never thought we should be able to have. So, so I think we were walking a pretty good line there. Um, we did, we added the character, uh, the girl inventor character. And that was a response to the studio executives that um, in one of my first meetings with them, they said, we're thinking you need a, would be nice to have a girl. Could we just make Max into a girl? And we don't ever have to say that Max is a girl. And both me and the story editor were going, how do you have a character in a show and you never refer to that, what they, what their gender is? It seemed like it was almost impossible, but to do. So I invented this character that was originally a male character that lived down in this kind of called it the sub basement of solitude. Cause I thought maybe they had a nerd friend that makes like weird devices for them or something. So we made it this girl that lived down there. Her name was Darla Guggenheek, otherwise known as the geek. So she wasn't in the show that much because you don't want to break up the duo. You know, the duo has a dynamic to it. 
that you want to maintain. And so if you put another character in there and now you have to think about what that does to the, to the dynamic of the original pair. So, so she was in a few episodes and just gave us some, you know, things to play with and stuff like that, but wasn't, you know, it didn't overtake the, the episode. As far as the other stuff, it was basically, if we were going to do something violent, what's the silly thing to do instead? And I think the characters of Sam and Max with their sort of callous disregard, you know, for most things was preserved pretty much. And speaking of toning down, did they ask you at LucasArts to tone down Sam and Max for the game? Not at all. Nobody ever came to us and said, hey, you can't do that. And I think that was the case with most of the games. They There's basically, you know, hands off the game designers for anything they were creating as far as sam and max the only reason they didn't have the guns very much is because in an adventure game the first thing you're going to want if you have a gun in your inventory you're going to want to use it for everything or at least try it and so it just felt yep. like this obstacle to have it there so um, we all made the choice let's just leave it out and then can't remember it might have been mike's idea i'm not sure of having a shooting gallery at the end so you could yeah. get your gun out during the credits, you could play with the gun all you wanted. Yeah, and, and you can shoot R two D two and the tentacle and yep. Guybrush. You can shoot Guybrush. That's right. So we had our little gun fix at the end. Mm-hmm. So after the TV series, you started working at ILM. Yeah, when was that? I guess so. Yeah, that makes sense. At some point, I moved, like, in the middle of that. I don't think mm -hmm. I had a job at the moment I moved. But, I, yeah, ILM, I think, was my next big sort of gig time. It was a freelance gig to work on the Frankenstein feature that they were developing. So, it wasn't ILM proper. It was this little kind of offshoot that was funded by Universal Studios. And they were this little project. And you work on visual effects? No, they didn't have any yet. It was just basically the story. So as a story artist, I was uh, doing storyboards for the different versions of the story that they were exploring. So you worked as a storyboard artist on the Frankenstein movie? Yes, the notorious Frankenstein movie that never came out. And, and I, did some, I did some character designs for it as well. So, you know, I always try to squeeze in some character design. Hey, what about these? So... You know, because that's what but the, I always like. They eventually use your drawing. work for anything. I think they used everything that everybody did, but none of it came out. So I don't, it's hard to determine what is used and what wasn't used because because the project was never completed. It was all part of the whatever the churn was that got them to, you know, through the development of it. And while you were working at ILM. You were also involved in uh, in the creation or the pre-production of an animated Monkey Island film. Is that true? That didn't come until after after the uh, Frankenstein project. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Like some of this is public knowledge. I'm not sure how much of it. I, go into assume that everything is public saying. knowledge on these conversations so feel free to say yeah, anything. i mean there was a group of us that after the monk after the uh frankenstein project was canceled um a, a handful of us were asked to go and work on feature ideas uh as part of ilm and so um they put us in a building that actually it was upstairs from where pixar was at the time Point Richmond, and so we were up there working on ideas for feature films, and uh, we'd see the Pixar people going in and out of their offices during the day. We looked down, yeah, you know, they're having so much fun. Oh, look, here comes another crew gift. <sighs> yeah, so we were kind of jealous of that because they were actually making their stuff. We were just coming up with ideas. We had a ton of ideas in a room, you know, in that facility, and um, they weren't. None of them were ever to come to fruition but it was sort of a little experiment i guess they were trying out for a while it was a fun one because i did a lot of painting and uh 
we would break up and lead little kind of mini crews to develop each of our ideas. So you'd work for a few weeks on something. And I would paint production paintings of characters, story, you know, notes and things like that. And then we pitched them to the group at the end. And uh, so we had a room full of intellectual properties. And how far into production did you go with the animated Monkey Island movie? Oh, the, I think it was like most of the others. I think it got a little further just because it had some attention at some point. And uh, so there, I did a lot of artwork for that. Some of it is online. You could find articles and stuff with people talking about it. Um, so some of my artwork is, you know, attached to some of the press that's kind of leaked out about that stuff. Um, there were some aspects of it that I hadn't heard. I'd heard a story about how uh, when they were pitching it to Steven Spielberg, he supposedly said, what if everybody's a monkey? Like, it's just a whole world of monkeys instead of any pirates. And so I, I don't remember that. Maybe it happened, but I don't remember like it happening. Planet of the Apes. Yeah, except cute, I guess. But, um, but I don't remember that anecdote. Uh, I just remember that it it sort of went outside of the group, unlike most of the project. Most of the project stayed inside the group, and that one actually was... I don't know that you can say it was pitched anywhere, but it was uh, reviewed outside of the internal group. I think Spielberg was one of the people that they were reviewing it with. And after you saw how much fun the people at Pixar are having, you decided to move to Pixar? Oh, yeah. I just jumped off the railing and went down in there and said, hey, I want to No, actually... Pixar by then had moved. I think we were there right around the time they were finishing up their days at Point Richmond. And our little group was, uh, I think we were running out of funding. And so they disbanded us. And I think they kept a, a skeleton crew and moved them up to Skywalker Ranch. And the rest of us kind of went off to do whatever we were going to do. And I got a call from Pixar, me and another friend, a couple other friends that were working with this feature group. And we went over and interviewed at Pixar as story artists. So, um, well, and while you were working at Pixar, uh, LucasArts approached you to create a new Sam and Max game. Yeah. Um, who did LucasArts? Yeah. I'm trying to think of <laughs> the time. Company. I mean, yeah, because there's different versions of Sam and Max's that either came to fruition or did. There was a uh, um, Infinite Machine version as well at some point, which I think mm -hmm. fell into the timeline around the time I was doing the ILM stuff, but I can't be sure when that was. But that was because Infinite something. Machine shut down. Yeah, when did they shut down? Do you remember? A year after they started production on that game. But they, I thought they were, had been working on something and I was working with them on the story for the Sam and Max game for a while. And it was based on something that I had, had been playing with in different, you know, different versions for, for years. So, um, yeah, I can't remember at what point we were doing that or at what point it ended, but there was a stretch there. It seemed like it was months that we worked on something for a while. But then, yeah, at some point, LucasArts kind of opened up communications again. Again, I can't see where it fits into this, you know, timeline, but it's like, hey, want to make a new Sam and Max game? It's like, really? really? And so went back there, chatted with them about that, and I think we figured out how it would work and, you know, the timeline, and Mike was going to lead it like Stanley, which was encouraging, and um, so yeah, but, uh, it must've been, we probably started talking about it. Yeah. In that time frame. I'm not sure how it fits with the ILM stuff. Cause I can't picture in my brain. Well, the Sam and Max like freelance happened. police started, it, it started development like after he moved to, to Pixar. Yeah. So yeah, I'm just trying to keep these things in line and 
And I think that's true that we started doing it because it's true. I was getting, I was sitting at my desk at Pixar and I was working on my own stuff at Pixar, but then they would send me animations and character designs and backgrounds and I would do draw overs for some of them and send them back. And there were whole sequences that were sort of coming together and it was really funny. And I was, you know, I would contribute as much as I could, but I wasn't there. So it wasn't, you know, everybody else was doing all the heavy lifting and, uh, and it was shaping up in a pretty interesting way. It was fun to see it, see it happening. And I, I can't remember what amount of time that was that we worked on it, but it seemed like it was a good chunk. Before yep. the cancellation. It was a couple of uh, years. And wait, so they sent you what? Weekly builds, monthly builds? They'd call you in to weekly, see the progress? Weekly is more like shots. It was more like shots and uh, animation shots and all the concept stuff they would show me. And, you know, anything I wanted to rethink, they would, you know, be agreeable to if I had a draw or something like that. What if it's this instead of that? There'd be a new character sometimes. If I had time, I would do a take on it and send it over. And so it was fun to sort of be involved with it, but, uh, you know, not going in every day working on it. And were you involved in the story itself or the puzzle design or the mini games? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the story is something we sorted out. Um, yeah, it was a, a very weird story. You know, we're always looking for. Stuff that I think for games with Sam and Max, I think modular stuff works well. And I think just game design in general, I think it helps to have stuff you can either add or subtract. Oh my God, we're, we have too many places to go and you take, take one or two out of, out of the equation. I think that's not a bad place to be. So it was, it was part of the reason it was mod is we were thinking of it like a serialized thing that you might download. I think that was one of the thoughts, but I'm not sure they were committed to that idea of it at the time, but we, we still had committed. modular. Yeah. We had still had the idea of different places to go and, you know, we had a Bernie, Bernie max festival and we had like a space station episode and we had like a, high school dance episode. And so there are a lot of really fun things that they were shaping up in a good way. The animation looked really funny. And so I was really pleased with how it was pretty cool. So the idea was to have six cases and then that would make the game episodic in a way. Yeah. I mean, if you receive those separately, it would certainly be episodic. If the, if the game had to be together, you know, you could still make a case for play as one piece. And as you know, in March 2004, LucasArts decided to release a press release and state that after careful evaluation of current marketplace realities and underlying economic considerations, we've decided that this was not the appropriate time to launch a graphic adventure game on the PC. Yeah. Let I don't me think about date, that statement. But... It was yeah. March 3rd. 2004. Yeah. I had forgotten the date. As you can tell, I'm not that great on dates and when things fall into a timeline. But yes, I do remember the event. I do remember the event happening. So when were you informed Mike's about the cancellation? I it must have been that day. And I think I heard it from Mike Stemley. I, and, and it might have been that, you know, I checked in, came into the office and heard it from him. That's so I. And so at, at that stage, I, I hear contradicting stories about the amount of work that has been put into this game. Like the several articles are, are talking about 80% done. Uh, some people say 70% done. Mike Stemley in my interview with him told me 60% done. So now you're going to tell me that it was 50%? I would done? assume Mike Stemley would know better than anybody that anybody else that you talked to since he was sitting there working on it. So I would trust his opinion about it. And by the way, the fact that I know uh, uh, the date, the March 3rd, 2004 is because in the Telltale series, they have a box of cases 
um, on top of oh, okay. uh, one of the lockers with a date, and Sam is saying that it's a pretty gruesome case. Oh yeah, because Dan was there on that crew. That was, that was that. Mm -hmm. when that happened. I'd send out a little notice. I don't send out press releases, but at the time, I just put out a public comment because. I just didn't want the crew to get blamed because the first thought I think people have when something like that, oh, this game must have been really messed up. So that's why they canceled it. So I just put out a statement in support of the crew just because I wanted to show that, in my opinion, they were doing what they were hired to do. And so that was just my, you know, just putting a stake in the ground saying, here's, as far as I can tell, here's what was going on. So. Apparently, it made some fans kind of irate, and and uh, which wasn't my intent, but it was nice and gratifying to hear that people were had been looking forward to the game. I was looking forward to the game, but when I when it was canceled, it didn't come as a surprise to me because a few months before that, they canceled Full Thrall too. So it seemed like LucasArts was just cleaning their slate by canceling all the adventure games that were in production so that they'll be able to create Star Wars games. You know, LucasArts didn't shy away from saying that they don't want to do adventure games anymore. They weren't even subtle yeah, about mean, it. The press release itself says this exact thing. Yeah, I mean, it's a clinical way of saying it. It's probably just based on people just being fearful that they were throwing money down a rat hole or something like that. So, you know, I don't know how else they would have said it that would make it more palatable. <laughs> but I just had to say my piece when it, when it happened just so I could show that I was pleased with what I was seeing and I was looking forward to it myself. So, um, it was just me expressing my disappointment at the choice. And were they pissed at LucasArts? because of your press release? I never heard anything directly. If I, if they were mad at me, I never heard it from them or anything else about, about that game. So if they were mad at me, it might have been. Maybe they were mad at me because it was probably irritating for them to have the fans piling on and kind of filling up their, their uh, chat boxes and stuff like that. So I don't know what they thought of it. Now, at that point, a lot of the people from the team who worked on Sam and Max Freelance Police quit their position at LucasArts and went and started a company called Telltale Games and probably waited for the Sam and Max license to expire. And how soon after the cancellation of uh, Sam and Max Freelance Police did Dan Connors or anyone at Telltale approach you with the possibility of creating? Sam and Max um, game. I mean, they wanted to do it, and we knew there was a time limit on the on the license. And I might have reached out to LucasArts to see if they'd let the license go earlier. And I think they chose not to for whatever reason. So we basically waited out the timeline, and just as soon as we could, we started talking about it. So you know, they were. I mean, what what was maybe good about that is they had some time to get their feet wet and do some projects before they got to Sam and Max. So they were sort of up and running by the time they got to Sam and Max. So Sam and Max was one of the first things they were creating. And you were working at Pixar at the same time. So how did you divide your time between working at Pixar and working at on the Sam and Max first season? Yeah. Again, it's a, it was a license and you have to, if you're going to do that kind of stuff, you either don't care what they do or you trust the people that you're working with. And in this case, I trusted that the crew knew what they were dealing with. And, you know, I would always say, Hey, if I had to worry about every part of this, it wouldn't be worth doing because it would end up being so much work to try to undo decisions that are made and stuff. So for me, if the crew understands what the property is, then, you know, they're then less grief for me and I can just enjoy what they're doing and I can contribute as much as I have time to, but it's not 
resting on my shoulders to keep things moving along. It's actually better if it's not resting on my shoulders. It's better. Competent people are making something happen and, and I get to respond to it more than trying to steer it myself. So, whatever time I could make, if there was a character or something like that, that I could feel like I could do a tweak on or sometimes, you know, an idea, some things, they would call me up and, hey, is it okay if we do this? I go, oh, I don't know. I never thought about that. Okay, I guess that sounds okay. And then, you know, there'd be story points. And stuff. We'd always meet at the beginning of a season and talk about, like, what's the broad scope of the story? What's the most fun collection of places and things to do that we can think of to put in this in this story? And then, for me, that's what the nut of it is, more so than what's it feel like to play the game. Feel For me, feeling what the game feels like is how much... Do I enjoy being in this environment? And so that's, that's how I come at it more than the nuts and bolts of how a puzzle is designed. You know, do I enjoy so these out of characters? All the so I like the to... Sam and Max games, uh, Hit the Road was the one you were most hands on. Yeah, I'd say so. Because I had a full time job at Pixar, so I couldn't write. You know, that was and just the only choice. Of, it wasn't like... Speaking of your full-time job at Pixar, what were you doing at Pixar at the same time? At the same time, the first thing that I was hired to work on there was Cars, the first Cars movie. And they they had a lot of uh, story artists that could do a, a cartoony style. And there was me and another artist that was hired, Garrett Sheldrew, who recently passed away. But we came over from the ILM group and we both had more of a realistic style. And so they felt like that might be a good addition to the, um, to the crew. And Garrett was amazing. Garrett just had this camera going in his hair, head. If you look up his work online, he's just, a, he was an amazing draftsman. But when he would do storyboards, he had a moving camera in his head and it just felt like you were, you know, just inhabiting the space that he was drawing. Like, he, it was just effortless for him. And he was kind of a um, quirky character, kind of a low-key guy that didn't have a lot to say, but he had all this talent kind of boiling out of him. It was amazing. And so we worked on that crew just doing storyboards, and I ended up getting to write some scenes because um, there were some times when we would work on something that wasn't fully fleshed out, so I'd get to do some writing. I remember writing a monologue for Paul Newman's character one time where he's describing that there was this tar machine. And so I wrote this whole long diatribe for Paul Newman to describe this machine. Like he's describing this beautiful piece of machinery with this, you know, sense of respect in his voice. And, uh, and it was cool because they actually recorded him saying it. So I get to hear Paul Newman saying stuff that I'd written, which is awesome. But being on that crew, one thing that was fun about it was getting to do what they call scratch voice recording where, you know, we don't have the crew, we don't have the actual actors in place. So we just use what they call the Pixar players. And so whoever's available would go in and do voices. So I would end up doing a lot of the Doc Hudson, the Paul Newman character. So, and I was also boarding a lot of his scenes too. So I'd got really attached to, to his character. And then I get to do, they asked me to do a, a birthday card for him. And so I did this image of his character, which ended up getting selected to be in the Pixar MoMA exhibit. So I got to go to New York and see, see one of my paintings hanging up in the MoMA. And that's when doing Scratch VO was the moment you fell in love with voice acting? Uh, I think as a kid, you know, I was always making recordings and things like that. So it's always, you know, Doing silly character voices has always been a fun thing for me all my life. But that was neat to have it be part of a work day. Like, okay, you're drawing for most of the day, but for 20 minutes, you're going to go downstairs and act out a scene and you're going to work with a director and, and you're going to try to accommodate what their notes are. And so it was a totally different sensibility, which was really helpful um, for mixing up the day and for you know, making me feel like I was sort of dipping into a new skill. 
Because I think I told you early on, and I always felt like I had to try a lot of different things in my Mm -hmm. career. And so, you know, being a storyboard artist wasn't something I sought out. I, when I did my interview at Pixar, it's like, well, let's see your storyboards. And my storyboards were totally disorganized. Like they're all out of order from the Frankenstein project. And so I'd kind of spread them out on the table. And, and then I had this pile of character drawings over on the side. I said, well, I do this too. And I think it was Joe Ramp to his interview. No, 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 we don't need that. And so he was kind of picking through my storyboards, but I didn't have any that were in order. They were just basically drawings that were sort of out of order. And I would assemble them when I was going to pitch them. But for presentation purposes, they were pretty haphazard. And, um, but he, you know, hired me anyway. And, uh, and I ended up enjoying that process as part it's almost like writing. So you're kind of, you know, trying to create the movie visually. And especially if there's not, uh, this, if the script is a little bit in flux, you get to explore a little more than you might if, uh, if you were on a strict deadline or if the script is more pinned down. Now, during your time at Pixar, LucasArts also decided to start working on the Monkey Island Special Editions. In 2009 and 2010, when the Special Editions of Monkey Island 1 and 2 came out, it was decided, apparently, to remove references and graphic assets oh. of elements that were not copyrighted by LucasArts. I'm not, as we I'm can not see here, as we can see here in Secret of Monkey Island, in the original one, we can see on the left, you have a Seven Max totem pole next to the giant yeah. monkey head. And that was replaced with a tentacle totem pole in the special edition. Uh, uh, makes sense to me. And while uh, in LeChuck's Revenge, the Max costume in the costume store was replaced by a tentacle costume. There you go. Now, my question is, were they being extra cautious in order to avoid potential trademark and copyright conflicts? Or was it yeah, requested absolutely. by you or Telltale, no. who at the time no, owned the I, rights? I doubt Telltale said anything to them. And, you know, Telltale only owned the rights to their own stuff. Um, and I wouldn't have said anything. I think they're just, you know, covering themselves in case suddenly I became some mogul or something and came after them. But, you know, I think it's just, you know, lawyers just being careful and covering their tracks and making sure they're above board way through. I'm not surprised or horrified by that. But the problem here, apart from <laughs> removing all seven max references, is that uh, it's a big problem. Was, it's a big problem. Was uh, voiced by Dominic Armato, who was the voice of okay. Guybrush in Curse of Mike Allen. So when we got to hear the voiced version of Monkey Allen 2, we couldn't listen to this amazing line, which is, <laughs> I want to buy the latest comic book by Steve Purcell. Because they removed that from the game as well. I don't know why that's, I don't know why that's contentious. That's just a thing you could say. I want to go buy a, you know, so-and-so car comic book. That doesn't, maybe saying somebody's name is, is a violation. I'm not sure. No, because, no, because it wouldn't make sense when you look at the yeah. Max costume, then it would make sense to say that line. Wouldn't make that, uh, it wouldn't make sense to say that line when you look at the No, you could just say costume. it randomly like he's insane or something like that. Yep. He just goes down the street saying that all day long. But you know, the interesting thing is that in 2016, when Day of the Tentacle Remastered came out, it still had the Max portrait intact, even when you switched to the remastered I believe mode. they asked me if they could do that. Really? I Double they fine asked you? If that was okay. I believe they asked me and I think I signed something so they could do it. Uh, that amazing. rings a bell for some reason. And if they did, I want to sue them. Sue them. No, don't sue them. I love Double Fine. Sue LucasArts. <laughs> now, in 2009, you were also commissioned by Telltale Games to create the cover art for the limited edition slipcover of Tales of Monkey Island. And I know that yeah. because I bought the limited edition just for that cover. Because, as you know, the game was downloadable, so I didn't need any physical copy of the game. 
but I ordered yeah. it so that I'll have this amazing slip cover. What was your experience returning to the Monk Island series after two installments in which you didn't create the cover art? Yeah, it was fun. And by that time, I'd sort of gotten to the point where, you know, I told you earlier, the only reason I didn't do Curse was because it had such a defined style. This one had a defined style as well. But at my, I'd gotten to the point where I felt like I could add something to this, or even if I'm just interpreting it through my painting style, maybe I can do something that still feels like it's mine, even though it's, you know, making use of their designs. So it was really fun to go back to it, especially after a, a break of not having paid to those characters in a while. It's really gratifying to go back and get to do something fun and kind of chasing some something that, you know, I was kind of looking for and doing it. Being a little bit more minimal as far as the composition and stuff. Now, is it accurate to say that one of the reasons for including Elaine in this cover was your dissatisfaction with her appearance on the cover of The Secret of McAllen? Oh, did I say that? Some interview or something? You said that on your blog. I did. I said I didn't like her. Maybe yep. so. How long ago did I write that? It might be true. 13, 13 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> It's completely accurate. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I might not have been ready to paint her when I painted her for the original cover, but I don't hate it. I'm sort of dis distanced from it, so I don't think about it that much. But this one's more... Actually, this one kind of goes back closer to like a Zach McCracken kind of interpretation of my... It's more my regular style, even though it's got their character design sensibility in it. It's closer to what I would normally paint. Where the first Monkey Island is kind of, oh, how do I get this to be more representational than my own stuff normally is? So I think I probably uh, was reaching for something more when I did this, the Monkey Island cover, that doing the Telltale one. What's not the like in this cover? <laughs> it's, it's all perfectly it's awesome. fine. You're, you're too critical of your own work. I actually he, changed his face. I think his he had a different expression on his face, and it was like, like a one time during that cover where I actually had to go and paint over something that I had painted in it. I can't remember. It might have been that he looked too young, and we aged him up a little bit, or did he? I can't remember if he had a smirk. There was something about his mouth that I had changed in that process. But again. But fortunately, this cover is, the subsequent is ones perfect. Change anything. And his expression <laughs> is amazing. Well, thanks for saying so. I remember his expression. Well, that's because we had to change it instead of the horrible first version I had, I guess. Sure. <laughs> now, now um, as a testament to the fact that you didn't like the design for Elaine in the first This is why game, people don't do interviews, because they come back 13 years later and say, isn't it true that you said 13 years ago that blah, 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 blah. Yeah, but it wasn't even an interview. You know, uh, when you read an interview, you always assume that the editor misinterpreted what the person he was interviewing it. said. Well, you're making but a good case for never blog. documenting anything you ever say. Yeah, your blog is still there <laughs> and you're still saying it back in 2010 or whatever. <laughs> Couldn't Tell stop saying it. Uh, you know, the sketches for the Tales of Monkey Island that we can see here all include Elaine because of that particular reason. You also said really? that. Really? I said that? Okay. Yeah. If you say I said that, I must, must have said it. Not only did you say that, uh, but... It's nice this... to have her in this. It's nice to have her in the composition. She's a good character. It's nice to have her there. And by here, by this time, I had learned, learned how to do my comps in... in uh, Photoshop. So I drew these on my on my Cintiq tablet, which saves saved a lot of time. But I don't have any paintings to show to anybody. Yeah. Okay. So another interesting thing is the fact that she told me that in McAllen two, Ron decided which of the three sketches would be the one used in the final game. But in Tales, as far as I know, Telltale ask you to make the final decision regarding which cover to use. 
Yeah. So why did you In that choose case, this I, I had one? to call up Ron and say, Ron, what should I do? I, I can't pick my own favorite cover. No, I mean, you know, it was their call and I like that one the best, I think. I, I think they actually implemented the third one. I think they made that into a poster for something. Um, the middle one, I can't remember if I was the attached middle one to it. I think this one? Yeah, I mean, the, the first one just, cut, I mean, it's just simpler and it's got a little bit of, you know, the ship around it and stuff. So it's got some some context around it. I think the third one is a little bit more obscure. You're not sure what what all that means. It, uh, it looks like a Charlie's Angels uh, yeah. ensemble. I think I probably thought, hey, if I'm close up, I can paint it faster because there's less stuff in the background. So back to Pixar. A few years after that, you started working on Brave. That's right. What can you tell me about that project? At the tail end of uh, the production run up to Cars, um, when the story was kind of wrapping up Cars, uh, Brenda Chapman, she had been pitching ideas at Pixar and asked me, because we had worked together a little bit on the Cars crew, she would brought on for a female point of view and asked me if I wanted to hear her pitch for her fair, fairy tale. And so I listened to it and I thought it was really interesting and like how grounded it was. It didn't, it didn't have like, you didn't turn the corner and there's another fantastic animal or something. It's very, felt like it was very rooted in the world of Scotland. And she was very passionate about it. And she wanted it to feel like a, maybe a fairy tale that nobody had heard of a folk tale that had been unearthed somewhere. And that all spoke to me. And it was fun to hear about something were way early on where there wasn't a lot of development in it yet. So she asked me if I would come on and be what they call the head of story, which would be the person that helps develop the story and leads the story crew in doing the storyboards. So I can't remember if there was any overlap or if I you know, was completely done with cars when I rolled onto that, started helping her and sort out that story. She had another writer. She was working with Irene Mecki who sort of helped get the, the bones of that story together. And I was there sort of, you know, offering ideas and helping visualize them. So if I did some merit of paintings, the main character, um, cause I love to have a chance to paint. So I did some kind of inspirational paintings of the main character sort of helped get a little footing into what she was going to look like and be like, so it was fun to help invent a Disney princess. If I, if I'm at San Diego and I see a Merida walk by, I say, Hey Merida, I helped invent you. So cars was released in 2006 and brave was released in 2012. That was so, a long run. So you worked yeah. six years on brave. Yeah. yeah. That's how long it takes to create a Pixar movie. Some of them do some go a little shorter, but some go longer. I always hear different. I can't remember what the most recent ones timelines are. Some of them are a harder kind of a uh, project to, to get a footing with. I mean, this one sort of went through some different, uh, different versions and just kind of hunting for who that character is and, and the, you know, what, what is, uh, there was a very different story early on where it was, um, had some other references that ended up falling out and newer ones took their place. Um, it had a kind of a snow element that was part of it as well. So, so sometimes it just takes, I mean, the story part is the part that takes the longest amount of time. So you just chase it until you feel like you're willing to move forward and get all the expensive people to come in and actually make the thing like story people story process is the cheapest part of it because it's people sitting in a room drawing and if it doesn't work you throw it away and you haven't committed too many hours you have you know animators you know commit hours to get seconds of animation hours and days to get seconds of animation so you don't want to engage them until you know what story is you want to tell and we talked earlier about the fact that when an artist 
looks at, at one of his creations for too long, he starts adding things to it because he might get bored or might not look as interesting when you look at something for too long. So how does that work when you work on a movie for six years? There's a trick to that because, um, you know, you think of a line or you think of a gag or something like that. And if it stays in from the beginning, it can be stale. And so it's a trick to try to have the point of view that something that you believed in a year ago is still working and that you're not just trying to replace stuff to make it fresh without improving it so that you know it's hard to keep those goggles on to help you uh keep a fresh eye so you aren't throwing away something that was worthy just because it's something you lived with for too long i think that's always a challenge I had heard one time that sometimes Brad Bird would leave his favorite jokes out of a real screening because he didn't want to get old once, you know, if you saw the screening a few times. So he had some hold some things back and then he'd put them in over time so that he'd always have something that he loved that wasn't going to have a chance to get old. So the, does that mean that you write the jokes, that you add the jokes at the end of the production just to make keep them fresh, at least in the production crew's eyes? No, I don't think you could do that. I think the way we do stuff, the, if there's jokes, if there's gags, they're sort of baked into what the structure of the story is. So I don't, I don't you, you know, there, you can do a pass where you go and try to make things funnier, but you can't really wait till the end to kind of build the humor in. It's, it's, that's what you're going to rely on for part of your story you sort of have to it has to be organic to the story as well so you just i mean the trick is just to try to keep a perspective where you aren't throwing away good stuff in favor of new stuff if that makes any sense it does but still it's interesting that you can keep these things interesting in the production crew's eyes after working on it for so long because up to this point, I presume that most of the projects you've worked on weren't things that required several years of production time. Unless you worked on yeah. The Dig, which you didn't. But uh, everything <laughs> else at LucasArts... No, I worked on sh shorter projects. I think there's something gratifying about doing something that's shorter, too, so you don't have a taunt and you don't have time to ruminate over things too long. Um, I did a show called Toy Story that time forgot and that was a mm -hmm. started as a short so i developed it as a short first so it was like a 10 minute long short and then i was asked to develop it as a half hour show and uh even so it still had to be done within i think we spent a couple of years on it but we did spend six years on it so um even so, so like the crew the story crew is one thing you're sort of watching the same things over and over but the subsequent crews like the animators like they're not they might see reels but they're not in there every day looking at it it's usually you're sitting with the editor and you're looking at those jokes over and over again and at some point you'll just stop laughing and hope that you were right when you laughed the first time interesting now the <laughs> story that Time Forgot was supposed to be a short that was supposed to be released before a Pixar movie, and then it turned into no. an ABC special? No, they were doing a series of, they did a series of Cars shorts, and they had a little group that was doing Cars shorts, and then uh, uh, they were released, I, I guess they were released to the Disney Channel with the Cars characters, and um, I can't remember if it was an effort to move into Toy Story once or not, but um, this one was just, you know, trying out some new characters within the Toy Story world to see what that felt like because it, you know, people were responding to it. They asked me to make it a full length half hour show. And they were also, they had worked on the um, Halloween one. So they wanted to, you know, do one that would come out at Christmas time. So my, my conceit on Christmas was make it take place right after Christmas. So it's all about the stuff the kids got. So here's the toys sitting in the room and these, this set of toys is not getting played with because the kid got the coolest 
game system and kind of animated chair that goes with it and stuff. So the toys are neglected and sort of go feral. Now, did you ever try to add Sam and Max cameos to any of your Pixar creations? Well, for the same reason that LucasArts would try to remove Sam and Max from their stuff. If I put Sam and Max into a Pixar thing, does that mean I'm giving Sam and Max to Pixar? Maybe so. So I just didn't want to cross the streams if I could help it. Cross pollination between the. If you look I, I at mean, well, the most recent thing I did was came out, I guess a couple of years ago now. Uh, Cars on the Road, which is a Disney Plus series. And if you look mm -hmm. at it, it's got a lot of Sam and Max sensibility in it. It's got no Sam and Max in it. it. Does. But I love road trips. And so there's going to be what feels like a crossover, but it's not, you know, it's all their characters, but it's got some of the stuff that I love in it. So it might feel like it's in that zone where they cross. Yeah, it has, it has the, the body comedy and it has the <laughs> road trip elements and it's episodic. So it's got all of the Sam and Max elements and it's you behind the wheel, literally and figuratively. So, you know, it, it's a, a spiritual successor to Sam and Max Hidro, <laughs> at least for me. Good. Now in 2023, at the beginning of 2023, Sam and Max Hidro Road Collector's Edition was announced by Limited Run Games. Now, unlike the yeah. other LucasArts collector's editions announced around the same time, this one's different due to your active involvement in its production, which may still be ongoing. I don't know. When were you approached about that project and what can you tell us about well, it? I had heard word about it years ago that they were talking years about ago. doing it. I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm sure they have a long list of these kind of things that they're going to approach. It might have been like two years ago or something. But um, I think I officially heard about it. I probably had a meeting with somebody on the phone talking about whether we were going to do it. And then Jake Rodkin, who I worked with at Telltale and who was the designer for the most recent Sam and Max comics collection, he was he got involved with it and started talking to me about whether I was gonna had time to, you know, work on any of these little tchotchkes and things like that. So I worked with him on on that stuff and kind of try try to figure out what would go in there and what would be new and make it worth having the game again. So it was fun kind of coming up with some things that were like throwbacks and other things that were new ideas and uh just uh, letting it all, I think, I think Jake's designing it so it all fits in, in a regular sized, uh, you know, game box rather than being a big giant thing. So I liked that idea as well. So it's been a fun thing to have that kind of throwback energy to the old game, which is amazing that anybody still cares about it. Well, I care about it. Yeah. Because well, if you care about it, it's worth having done it. Well, that's the way limited run uh, games works. They that's why it's called see limited. How many run. copies? Yeah, they see how many copies they sell. And Daniel's going to buy use... two, and so that makes it worthwhile. Mm hmm. So the the my issue with uh, Seven Max Seed the Road is the fact that I got my copy of Seven Max Seed the Road along with my CD-ROM drive. If you remember back in the nineties, you'd buy a CD-ROM drive and it would come bundled with yeah, CD-ROM games. Yeah. So I got a uh, Seven Max in the Road in a jewel case, and I wow. only have the CD. So I never had the big um, box. I never had the box. Seven Max in the Road. Well, here's the box. So now with limited run games, I can finally own a copy of the big box. I wonder how many Seven Max in the Road. Wonder how many kids went. Ah, oh, Seven and Max. Oh. Well, now that's cool. You know, I, I like that awesome he wanted game. to preserve the idea of the box. He redesigned the back cover and had mm -hmm. more like looked like Polaroid photos of the locations and stuff. And, and, uh, and I did a version of the map with their like scrawled path on it. So it was fun to kind of revisit some of that stuff and upgrade other parts of it. And we read you know, people the, online the were pen. trying to find people online. were trying to find which Atlas 
was used for the scan oh. of the map of the Are they US. trying to get us sued? Well, they found it. So Oh, did they? Expect uh -oh. a lawsuit in the near future. Oh, I have nothing to do with it. I'm not a party to that atlas. They can somebody down at uh, LucasArts 30 years ago picked that up. But we redid the old pin. I was selling that pin and that pin used to be in the um, in the catalog, in the adventurer catalog. It had that one mm -hmm. and another one. And so we redid a version of that pin. I think it's, we upgraded it because the one at the time was sort of a little cheesy, but uh, so hopefully it will have this new pin. It probably sold better than the leather jackets, the fine leather jackets they were selling in the adventure. I'm trying to remember that. I don't have a recollection. Yeah. First of all, they were, they were selling leather jackets, Indiana Jones leather jackets in the adventure. And second, it became a running gag with uh, LucasArts games because every time there'd be a dialogue right. option of someone saying, I'm selling these fine leather jackets. You know, um, all the time I worked at LucasArts, I never met George. My wife worked for Lucas Learning and she worked with George and met him and worked with him a lot. And, and somehow I never crossed paths with George at the company itself. Some one time when he and Stilberg came and looking for Larry Holland or something. But, uh, but then somebody that worked in their licensing kind of mail order office told me that George had ordered a couple of Sam and Max t-shirts for one of his producers on Young Indy. It's just fun to hear. Oh, he knows these guys. Yeah. He knows There's one other time when guys. I, I heard uh, they, they had done this reel one year and it was all the title sequences from all their games. And it mm -hmm. was just kind of like a rep, you know, recalling the history of the, of the company. And George looked at the first cut and they had left Sam and Max out because Sam and Max is a license and they don't want it. And so they left it out of the reel. And supposedly George's first note was, where's Sam and Max? So I just like hearing See, that George said Sam and Max out loud. I think that's gratifying. Brand recognition. You get hired at LucasArts, then shove Sam and Max into every possible game you've worked <laughs> on. Then people who get trained that scum you have to work with sample That's characters, right. which yeah. apparently are, you can only create a uh, seven max characters at scum you. And then you get the, the LucasArts fans who own right. the adventurer uh, magazines. It's like engineering a, a yeah. virus, a bio weapon. Exactly. You engineer it and then you kind of feed it into different channels until you get your result that you need, which is people buying t-shirts. I mean, just think that someone had to, you know, there are lines in the Monkey Island special editions that were removed. So, for example, instead of saying ghost bu busting pirate, he's saying a <laughs> Lachuk busting pirate, for example. <laughs> so, uh, removing that. lines with trademarked uh, properties is easier because you could you just need to read the lines and you have to read the lines because they had to record them so they were able to notice which trademark properties were mentioned but with yep. seven max they had to play through the entire game to find the seven max references and remove That's them right. visually from the game <laughs> so like look at the mess you made steve well, I'm creating jobs, Perry. <laughs> Speaking of creating jobs, did you uh, play the uh, Sam and Max? This time is it's a virtual game. I did play it. Uh, Mike sent it to me because I don't normally play VR games, and I don't have the headset. We, you know, sent me the stuff, and my reaction to it, it was, I loved having you know Stemley's dialogue in there. It's awesome. My first reaction was like, oh. This is what it would feel like to be at the Sam and Max theme park because I'm walking around and the characters are in scale with me and, you know, all the stuff is like in the space, which is very weird. So it was, it was very eye opening to sort of be in that kind of environment with the characters. Now, we just talked about the, the classic pin, but mm -hmm. in addition to the classic pin, there were there were also 
protected by seven max stickers which oh yeah you guys used and were cursed for some reason what's the story with that did larry tell you about his he didn't did larry but i know about his oh yeah oh yeah larry i, I think there was more than one person who used that sticker had some mishap that happened i think i thought larry I thought Larry told me that his truck was stolen. Maybe it's one of those stories like the whip story that it wasn't stolen, but he broke the window or something. Something shortly after having put that sticker on his car, it's like caused a mishap to the car. So I like to think I'm responsible for uh, cursing people's cars having drawn that sticker. It was, we so made let, it as let, a- Let's assume that this story is true because otherwise Larry committed insurance fraud by s- sticking a <laughs> salmon max sticker on That's his right. window he upgraded the value of his truck so larry got his uh, truck stolen there was another one after he placed the sticker and the other one is your story what was my story is it on my blog from 20 years ago put one on the window of your acura and yeah. an out ah. out of control audi loud into it in front of a yeah. comic book shop absolutely yeah I was lingering at the front desk and I was uh, about buying my few comics that I was going to buy there and I had gotten this primo spot right across the street and then I heard <laughs> and uh, some car had lost control coming around the corner down the block and hit every car on the street on the way to mine, it hit mine so far hard it moved it, uh, you know, parking space ahead of where it was parked and totaled it so, so these was, stickers were basically modern voodoo dolls it's like a target yeah it's like a targeting device but we made them to take to san diego one year we had them as like little chachis in san diego and then a meteor struck not that year <laughs> we can blame it for a delayed pandemic response which canceled the canceled the convention well, maybe the stickers uh, started the pandemic. That's right. Who knows? It takes a while for them to get their footing. Yeah. Considering the Sam and Max have appeared in, in various forms, such as comics, TV shows, standard computer games, episodic computer games, VR yeah. games, and more, which medium do you think suits Sam and Max best? Oh... Um, people always say, oh, you should make a movie. You should make a Sam and X movie. I think that's something I think they could, I, I think they're resilient to ad- adaptation. I think they can survive in different mediums. So there might be some movie. I don't know. There's a mass market movie of them that could be made if they're going to be sort of true to themselves. I think, I don't know if they're friendly enough or if they're pro social enough. I think, uh, They'd have to be more of a kind of alter, alternative kind of audience, maybe. Um, I think they, I think they're fine on TV. I think they, I'd be up for trying, trying another shot at TV and seeing if there's a home for them in a TV series. I, I like the idea of kind of reducing their stories down rather than having, you know, even though I've done the longer comics, I sort of like the little compact versions because you're sort of in and then you have your fun and then you go away and sort of create a new world the next time you uh, drop them into something. Well, nowadays, I short mean, form what videos I, are very popular. Yeah. I mean, what I like about those mediums, like I think there's something a little opaque about in the process of game design where the dialogue is not really written like a script. It's written into pages of code and so it's harder to kind of make notes into it so uh, a lot of my uh collaboration with like telltale would be kind of trusting their opinions and you know giving them broad notes rather than trying to edit a script which is probably for the best because if i'm sitting there editing a a script for them i think it would be it would take so much time it would be um counterproductive i mean i kind of understand tv and i understand movies so i know i think i know how i would approach doing either one with the characters and what's your favorite sam and max story and or adaptation oh adaptation uh 
I'm fond of the first game. I mean, because I got to be there every day. And, uh, I got married during the production of it. And um, since it was kind of loosely based on the comic that came out right before it, it feels like it's in perfect character to the to the uh, property. Um, I think of my own favorite stories. Uh, there's one that I, I like visually called uh, Beast from the Cereal Isle, which is kind of a short story where there's like some paranormal saying comes out of the in, in a grocery store and attacks Sam and Max and and I think and I had fun doing the art for that and kind of trying to do stuff that was a little more dynamic in there that's very small and self-contained. It was fun to do. Now, before we conclude our conversation, I have tons of questions from our viewers. You have viewers? I, yeah. They must have nothing but spare time to watch four-hour videos every day. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and they're going to watch this one as well. And then we'll get more questions that will say, why did you make a video of that guy? W wait till I get Sean Clark. <laughs> you know, Sean Clark is playing mind games with me. Because Sean Clark is not replying to my emails. Yeah. And yet, he's the first one on LinkedIn to yeah. like the posts I make about my conversations. So every time oh, I make no. a post about one of my conversations, he's the first one to, to like them. But then he ignores my DMs. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And I, where do these questions, questions come from? You just say, From my viewers. someday we're going to ask this guy this question. Do you have anything? Why? Well, believe it or not, this is the longest list of questions I ever got for a guest. <laughs> and <laughs> people have been waiting to ask you a bunch of things for several years now. Well, I can't so, wait to disappoint them. Yeah. Okay. So first of all, Jan Hofmeister, I don't know if you know him or know his name. He's been working with the last couple of years on restorations and uh, upscaling of your classic cover art. Oh, he's the guy who does those game. big high-res poster mm -hmm. things? Yeah. Yep. So all of the posters we saw today were from his... I'm going to uh, sue him any minute. No, I'm just kidding. I, I'm going to edit this clip <laughs> out and send it to him before I put... <laughs> I'm coming for you. So Jan Hofmeister, who's... I'm coming. <laughs> Take your medicine. I'm coming for you. You know, if you come after Jan, then LucasArts will come after you. That's the circle of life, I think. No, I'm going to just sick them on him. That's what I'll do. No, I think it's amazing what he does. I don't even know how he does what he does. It's bizarre. Like, how does he know what's behind the letters? That's the, <laughs> the, the art. I, I, well, you saw what's behind anyway, the letters. Anyway, you had a question from him. <laughs> Jan Hofmeister, whose high quality restorations of your iconic cover art were presented in this conversation, asks, what were your different approaches for painting the cover arts for Zach McCracken, The Secret of McCann, The Chuck's Revenge, and Sam and Max Hit the Road? While undeniably coming from your hand, their style is somewhat different in terms of line work and texture. Oh, um, yeah. So uh, the mediums, or there's a couple of mediums that work. Uh, the Zach one was done in gouache, which is an opaque watercolor. And it was something I was doing a lot of my D&D &D base covers on. And so I was comfortable with that. And also the style of the interpretation of the characters is more sort of in my comic style. Monkey Island, I was actually the first Monkey Island was actually given the task to see if I could make it more representational, make the characters feel more realistic. So I'm you know, saying realistic because it's still my kind of cartoony realism. And so I was pushing that aspect of it more. There's a little bit more kind of gradated, you know, in the in the light to dark. There's this more um transition in between a lot of that stuff. Um, LeChuck's Revenge was an oil painting. And so that has a different 
flavor to it no matter what it has kind of uh there's like a tangible weight to the to the pigment and um sometimes you can see the strokes chopped into it in a way that my other stuff might not have um it stays wet longer so you're able to maneuver it around for a longer amount of time uh, i was trying to get a lot of like i said before sort of a richness to it um so that was that was very uh conscious decision and then the last one was salmon max is all right hit the rope mm-hmm. so that one was i think that's closer to the way i would normally paint one of the comics covers and maybe it's a little softer maybe it's not as defined it's it's probably a little softer because i'd probably spent more time rendering it trying to get a little bit more um i guess like with the background stuff behind them i've sort of neutralized the shades back there to give some perspective and stuff like that so it's a, it's a little bit it's a, more of a uh fussed over a version of my comic style so i think it's closest to what my comic style is comic cover style and you even got the cone of tragedy right here i noticed it only a few years ago that's right i love the cone i heard uh, larry talking about his animation on that it was fun to hear her talk about because i couldn't so i didn't notice arrived that it. the cone of tragedy was over here until a few years ago again that's the beauty of uh, of a uh, recover art the fact that you can still find i'll things. just say about larry's animation larry was talking about the knives coming out and he had seen a nice mm-hmm. display and a and a start i remember what the reason that made me laugh is because it was so incongruous and it's a style of humor that i really enjoy it's like what i loved about monty python and stuff when i was younger is this thing it doesn't make sense at all like that there's knife blades coming out of a carnival ride but it sets a tone that makes me laugh because it says this is absurd it's telling me it's absurd and then the fact that the characters are hanging upside down in manacles was absurd and fun to me so that's what i appreciated about larry's brilliant animation bashar asks you mentioned once you're not considering a pixar 7 max movie due to it not being a traditional pixar story would you consider an alternative today such as a netflix series perhaps Yeah, I mean, I don't think anybody would expect that Sam and Max falls into the catalog of Pixar type stories. So, you know, somebody that I don't know that you would go to Netflix and think that they have a house kind of style of storytelling. So I think that's why like a place like that makes more sense where and also um, to do a Pixar Sam and Max, you'd have to sell your property to that so netflix has raunchy animation series so yeah are you saying my stuff is raunchy is that what you're trying to say oh okay i'm out um no i think it's really about that there's an expectation that comes from the pixar brand and that, uh you know i've worked in that brand and so i'm happy to be in that brand but i don't see sam effect being part of that kind of a brand Anna from the Classic Gamers Guild podcast asks, how do you handle the concept of canon in the Seven Max universe, especially when fans inquire about specific details like the location of their office or their ages? Yeah, I, it's funny because I don't care about canon at all. Like, <laughs> it, it barely enters my mind. Like, if there's something I can use from a previous story or adaptation, I'm happy to put it in or to you know tip a hat to something that i liked previously but i think there's sort of a i think it's maybe not not the healthiest thing to chase canon it's funny because i love the show leave it to beaver and i don't know if you know the show but it was like a 60s show about a you know a mm-hmm. neighborhood with the two boys living in this idealistic neighborhood and I, I'm on a Facebook page for Leave it to be where people go, I noticed when June carried the coffee pot to the table, she touched the bottom of the pot, even though it would be really hot and stuff like that, or where's their room in the house and stuff like that, I feel like is it's going off into some zone that has nothing to do with the fun of 
the storytelling of the worlds. And when they made those shows, like whoever knew they'd be talking about them 60 years later. But for me, it's are the characters true to themselves? That's where the canon comes in. If the characters are, I don't want to change the character from one story to another, to, from one to another, but if they have a basement of solitude in the cartoon show and they don't have it in the comic, that doesn't bother me at all. You don't have to go way back to the 60s. You can see that even in sitcoms from the 80s and the 90s, usually each episode would be standalone. And things from the previous episode and things from the next episode, even if they should have major changes, should create major changes in the plot or whatever, they don't. So, Sam and Max I mean, is like uh, a 90s sitcom. Well, I always point to something like, you know, how many Batmans have there been and how many Batman stories and each, each one of those stories sort of has its own set of, you know, elements that are are necessary for that version of the story that are not necessarily carried over from one to the next. So I kind of think of it like as long as I recognize Sam and Max themselves, even if their voice actors are different or whatever that I'm satisfied, I, I'm happy to kind of play with the world and bend it to the will of whatever the story is they want to be in. Well, what you said about Batman may have been true until a few years ago when they started with the whole multiverse thing, and now all of the Batman stories are canon. Because they uh, each take place in a different universe. Yeah, I feel like that's a little bit of a cheat. It's yep. like, just saying there's different universes is not really solving the problem with, with whether something is canon or not. It's just saying, we don't have a canon, and so we're just going to call it a multiverse. I don't know, that's what it feels like to me. I fear the day when they'll do the same with uh, the Bond series, in which they'll acknowledge all of the Bonds and <laughs> they'll all be canon and somehow Sean Connery and Roger Moore and Daniel Craig yeah. will meet digitally somewhere. Yeah. I can't think of a worse idea, but yeah, that, that might happen. <laughs> Back to Jan Hofmeister. Jan Hofmeister asks, what were your inspirations for the characters on the code wheel? for The Secret of McAllen, and how exactly were they painted? Were you the one who chose the lilac background we see on the wheel, which blends so nicely with the drawings? I did not choose the lilac background, and those characters were drawn in pen and ink, and then I painted on to a... I had them in a lineup, and I painted in watercolors on each one. And when I was designing them, I had to design them so they'd line up with each other. So I had like a little template so that somebody's mm -hmm. head wouldn't like do a jump. I was trying to keep them sort of lined up in a way so there would always be a connection. So you could always have a face out of them. I think it worked. Um, but that's, you know, it was sort of the function came first and then I had to figure out how to get all these different faces. As far as their inspiration, just looking for quirky, weird strange characters that felt like they fit into the shaggy monkey island world i always i always feel like the show that show our flag means death feels like sort of a modern monkey island kind of tape it feels like it's in that wheelhouse to me johnny walker asks why does flint paper fire a bullet with max's name etched into it and hit the rope we can see the bullet over here. Yeah, because it's like, that bullet had your name on it. It's like that old kind of saw. I, I think I did that in one, one of the comics, too, where there's a bullet that goes through. It's an unfinished comic where a bullet goes through Max's ear and the bullet, you can see his name on it. And it's basically just a homage to that old gag from the, or the line from gangster movies. That bullet had, had your name on it kind of thing. Awesome. I can't remember if you could see it in real time. No, you don't see it in real time. You need to pause the game at a specific you know, uh, frame. Your game has to break just down so you can read Well, it. back then, some of us had really slow computers, so we had to watch the frame-by-frame -frame animation in one frame per second. But we actually saw that. Um, nice. Salty Horse asks, is there hope for more 7 Max comics? 
there's always hope. I don't like to promise them because sometimes I've promised stuff in the past and that when it doesn't happen, I feel guilty. So um, I'd, it, I'd always like to do more. It's such a time consuming thing. And I just have to make sure that if I was ever going to do one, I, I'm allowing myself enough time to do it the way I want to do. So that's the only thing that's stopping is it's like, uh, I think I could find somebody to print it if I made one. So I'll just say I'm extremely hopeful on this mid on the scale of not at all too hopeful I'll put myself in the middle of the upper section you can always launch a kickstarter yeah that sounds like more work than making a comic the idea is to to launch a kickstarter in order to make a comic yeah i think the most successful kickstarters have the comic done and then they do the kickstarter instead of Oh, good. I have some money. I'm going to go off and do this comic and then work on it for five years or something like that. Never have a comic. I think you have to have the comic first and then you do the Kickstarter to decide how many publish. Tell people you have the comic, launch a Kickstarter, and make the comic. Good idea. Jan Hofmeister asks Did you use your own likeness as a reference? That guy. Did you use your own <laughs> likeness as a reference for Zach on the Zach McCracken cover art painting? Unintentionally. Okay. That's the best I can do. I didn't try to paint myself. I thought that would, that might be a little arrogant. So I think I just ended up like that. And one last question from me. What are your plans for 2024 and how can people stay in touch with you and your work? For example, can they read your blog oh, okay. and then ask you about it 10 years later? Yeah, I mean, my uh, probably was 10 years ago that I put anything on that blog. Mm -hmm. You can go to uh, Sam and Max Funhouse. So if anything new happens, I put it on that Facebook page. I think even a, just a regular Google search of Sam and Max Funhouse takes you to that, to that Facebook page. But it's basically just a place if a toy is coming out or so if I do a drawing or something, I'll put it on there. I, I, I was on Instagram for a while and I should figure out how I want to do Instagram, but Right now, I don't have much of an Instagram presence, but if they want to see what's going on, I'll post it on Sam and Max Plans. You should open a TikTok account and start posting Sam and Max shorts on the bell account. Well, that's a good idea. Oh, the other part of the question, what's in store for Sam and Max in 24? No, right? what are your plans that? for 2024 no. apart from Ume? Opening oh, a me, TikTok whether account. it has to do yeah. with Sam and Max or yeah. not. Probably not a TikTok account, but uh, I'd like to do... I, I always effort to do more painting. Um, when I was painting at that... We were talking about ILM. When I was there, I painted all the time, and I had a style I really liked. And I've sort of fallen away, and I need to kind of regain the confidence that I was having when I was doing those production paintings. So I'd like to just devote some more time to getting back to that and... If there's some more storytelling stuff I could do, I'm, I'm excited to try to get some more stuff out into the world. Cool. And don't forget to launch the Kickstarter campaign we talked about. <laughs> I'm going to bring you in as a consultant. No problem. So I can just sit back and you can worry about yep. it. I'll even make a game for you, being a game developer <laughs> and all. That sounds fine. Go for it. Those kind of things. If there's somebody that has the passion to make a thing like that happen and they're not waiting for me to do it that's more likely to happen like you know when i did the toys it was so great to work with a company where they already knew what they wanted to do and i could help them kind of steer it stuff like that so i i love when people sort of come to me with something that they're excited about doing that's how the best things happen for me so if i come to you with an idea for a seven max game and i organize the entire production behind it would you be up for it how would i say no to that uh, it, it. well thank you so much steve for joining me for a conversation today no thanks a lot. it's truly been an honor to talk to you